a different. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us in this first and only meeting for December 2021. Uh, we welcome you to the Board of Education and cannot wait to both present to you, hear from you, and have discussion amongst ourselves. With that, we've already uh, established a quorum. We have two that will be joining us virtually, Mr. Little and Dr. Gentry. Uh, we will now have a Pledge of Allegiance by Jen, would you mind? Yes, you, Jen. <laughs> Please do. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Now we will move into awards and recognition uh, with East High School's football team. Dr. Bella. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Chair Bugs, and good evening, board members. I'm excited about several awards and recognitions that we're presenting tonight to honor some of our outstanding student athletes and athletic leaders. First up, as they walk up to the front, are the Eagles of East Nashville Magnet High School. Let me start by saying what a great season. The Eagles won the football regular season region title and earned home field advantage in the playoffs. Behind a balanced, explosive offense and hard-hitting defense, the Eagles marched through the playoffs, captured the hearts and support of the community, and reached the TSSAA Class 3A Blue Cross Bowl in Chattanooga, finishing as runner-up. It is the first time in East Nashville history that the Eagles reached the state championship game and East started playing football in 1932. It was truly a team effort and I was proud to be there in Chattanooga to cheer them on alongside so many of their other fans who made the trip to support them, support them and the team. Congratulations to head coach Jamal Stewart and his staff on a job well done and congratulations executive principal. Down. Executive Principal Jamie Jenkins, thank you for your leadership and your administration. As well as the wonderful faculty, staff, students, and fans at East Nashville High School. Most of all, congratulations to the players, the team, East Nashville High School Eagles. We are so proud of you. Congratulations. You ready for the next round? 
Yes, ma'am, I'm ready. All right, congratulations again as they head out, because I know they have school tomorrow and likely exams. Congratulations, East Nashville High School. <laughs> the young people say, out east for life. This is the cutest <laughs> thing. All right, we now, we also have uh, a recognition of TSSAA Region 5 Principal of the Year. Uh, Dr. Battle? Yes, ma'am. Next up is Cane Ridge High School's executive principal, Ms. Michelle Sanchez. If you can join us at the podium. SSAA honored Principal Sanchez at their annual meeting last month, naming her Principal of the Year for Athletics District 5. She has led Cane Ridge since 2010 and serves as a member of the TSSAA Board of Control. Principal Sanchez, we appreciate your service with TSSAA, and we're proud that they recognize your good work at Cane Ridge High School. Congratulations on this honor. All right, congratulations again, Ms. Sanchez. Now we have a, another recognition from Mr. Football Class 4A, Dr. Battle. All right, finally, congratulations to Barryon Brown on being named the 2021 Class 4A Tennessee Titans Mr. Football. Now let me tell you a little bit about him. This Pearl Cone High School senior had a tremendous season with 59 carries for 817 yards and 10 touchdowns, along with 22 catches for 303 yards and three more touchdowns. And he played defense for the Firebirds too and made 24 tackles. Marion is the third Metro National Public Schools football player in the history of the award to win Mr. Football. Most importantly, Barion has committed to continue his education and play football at the University of Kentucky. And now we're going to keep reading and hearing his name for years to come. Congratulations, Barion. All right, and now we're going to turn it over to the Glencliff High School Ambassadors for a presentation about all the great work they're doing this year. Ambassadors and our wonderful academy coach, y'all come on up and share with us.
Good evening. I am Tomi Kelly, the Academy Coach at Glencliff High School, and we're so excited for this opportunity to share with you our Academy story. Buenas tardes. Mesa El Ger. Good evening. And we this bring, bring you greetings from one of the most diverse, diverse high schools in Tennessee, Glencliff High School. school. I am Barahan Tuli, a senior in the Academy of Agriculture, Automotive, and Technology in the Technology Pathway. I am Anna Chicas, a senior in the Academy of Health and Hospitality and the Therapeutic Services Pathway. And I am Mercy Bustamante, a senior in the Academy of Agriculture, Automotive, and Technology in the Pathway of Environmental Biotechnology. And this, and this is, is our academy, academy story. The academy structure at Glencliff High School has shaped my academic and personal experience throughout the past three years. Prior to high school, I was homeschooled for roughly four years, and the transition from homeschool to a public school was difficult. But coming into an accepting environment where being from an ethnical background is valued, and where you have different resources available for you made it a lot easier. When I chose my academy and pathway, I did not expect to build the relationships I now have with my teachers, specifically those who I have worked with for the past three years through my pathway. Having similar faces every year gave me an opportunity to get the best help. My teachers know my strengths and weaknesses, allowing me to excel academically and perform better each year. My engagement with my school and community has shaped my experience at Glencliff. Being involved in academic programs such as Student Government Association, Beta Club, Academy Ambassadors, as well as programs that promote inclusivity like International Teens Outreach Program, Escalera, and International Day has boosted my overall experience during high school. Glencliff offers engaging extracurriculars ranging from those in each academy and pathway, including Future Farmers of America, Health Occupation Students of America, to sports and other clubs. I'm in peer tutoring, which is basically best buddies, but as a class. I am given the ability to guide my peers emotionally and academically. I would not have received this, op this opportunity if I wasn't at Glencliff, and if it wasn't for my technology pathway teacher that encouraged me to sign up. Our academy and pathway teachers are not only CTE teachers, but also close individuals. Being a part of the environmental biotechnology pathway has allowed me to expand my knowledge in the industry of agriculture by giving me hands-on activities that have shifted my interest in the agriculture field. Some of the opportunities given to me by this pathway were earning the OSHA 10 industry certification as well as nine college credit hours through dual credit with Tennessee State University. Working with business partners, I have been given the opportunity to attend industry-related field trips with Tennessee State University and Middle Tennessee State University, Colleges of Agriculture. This has laid the foundation for my post-secondary plans. After graduation, I plan to attend Belmont and study nursing. After graduation, I plan to attend Belmont University to study architecture. After graduation, I plan to attend Belmont University and study nursing. Thank you so much for the opportunity of listening to our Academy story. We hope you have a safe and great holiday season. And they are the best high school in the entire district. Thank you very much. You and your one high school. My one high school, but the best high school. Thank you. You can tell I like my school, don't you? <laughs> you tried to take it away from me, ma'am. I'm, I'm like, I I'm already have seven. <laughs> all right, uh, so congratulations to those students, those families, and all of the staff that support those students every day. Uh, with that, we'll kick it over to Dr. Battle for the director's report for the day. For the day. All right, thank you again, Chair Bugs, and to our um, school board members. I wanted to start off tonight by thanking um, First MNEA for the opportunity to speak with their members last night at the town hall and to answer some of their questions about the work we're doing to address the challenges experienced across our district and in all schools across the country. Um, thank you all for that space and opportunity and time to collaborate. 
Um, the other day, I also had the pleasure of watching a panel discussion featuring some of our own MPS teachers from around the district. I got to hear them talk about their work, their challenges, but also their excitement um, that they've had about some of the new ways they're connecting with their kids. Um, for example, through our Navigator program, adopting new ways of teaching that are designed to accelerate learning and academic progress, and the way school teams have coalesced around each other to build off the successes and tackle ongoing challenges. It has never been an easy job, and it hasn't gotten easier during the pandemic. But I know how much our teachers recognize the significant needs of our students and have stepped up to support them in so many ways. So um, thank you again to our entire Team MMPS. Now, as a reminder, on August 5th, the board approved a motion requiring universal masking throughout the district based on CDC and AAP recommendations and consistent with Metro's masking requirements for government facilities. Metro's mask requirements have since been nullified by the state of Tennessee's new law, which created Title 14 to restrict local governmental entities and private employers from taking some common sense mitigation strategies to reduce the spread of COVID-19. The new law also sought to preempt school districts from following CDC guidelines on masking in schools, but that action was halted by the U.S. District Court. Two days later, after Governor Lee signed this legislation into law, Judge Waverly Crenshaw issued a stay to prevent enforcement, and this past Friday, he issued a more thorough injunction, not only for the mass components of the new law relative to schools, but also the restrictions on quarantines. The injunction does not require masking in all school facilities, but rather gives school districts the ability to continue making those decisions to protect the health and well-being of students and the staff we serve. I believe we all desire a return to normalcy. However, hopes of the pandemic going away have been dashed several times over the past year and a half with new waves and variants that have caused us to take added precautions to mitigate against the spread of the virus. Currently, we are still requ requiring masks indoors, and the CDC still recommends this precaution be taken in schools. In that regard, little has changed since the board adopted the mask requirements at the start of the school year. What has changed is access to the vaccine for everyone age five and up. It takes five weeks from the first do dose of the Pfizer vaccine for someone to be considered fully vaccinated, and that is occurring right as we approach winter break for those students first in line. MAPS has partnered with the health department to offer vaccine clinics to support vaccination efforts, and we'll continue doing our part to ensure our students and staff have access to the vaccine. Over the next few weeks, we will continue monitoring the conditions as it relates to community spread, the risk posed by the new variant. So with that, my recommendation to the board is that we review current conditions and context at the next board meeting to consider moving to a policy of mass being strongly encouraged but not required. As I mentioned before, the federal court decision has halted the new law that limits the authority to quarantine relative to schools. Based on the new law, we ended the practice of quarantine in close contacts, but we have maintained that any student who tests positive for COVID-19 must remain isolated for the 10-day period before returning to school. While CDC recommends close contact quarantines for students who are within three feet of another student in a classroom setting that is tested positive, the most recent Department of Health recommendations are that students who are wearing masks don't have to quarantine if they are close contacts. My recommendation is that we continue to monitor the situation and seek feedback and guidance from local health department. If we see transmission rates increasing, we would reconsider our current practices and possibly look to what other states and districts are doing with regards to test to stay policies that require students who are close contacts to get tested for COVID-19 if they want to remain in the classroom environment. However, at this time, I don't recommend changes to our existing policies. Now, I want to take a moment to provide um, an overview and update um, of our ESSER 3 application. Um, for those of you watching at home as well, and for those of you who are here, our ESSER 3 application was finally approved by the Commission of Education on November 29th. The ESSER 3.0 process was the most involved to date and required a significant amount of stakeholder engagement into the final plan. There are also a lot more strings attached in this funding allotment, and there have been many rule revisions or updated guidance that came from the state in the middle of the process, which required several adjustments to ensure we are in full compliance with all their requirements. Now, that plan has been approved. Our teams are able to make those strategic investments in areas such as technology, transportation, academic resources, and materials. Um, social, emotional, and mental health needs of our students with investments in restorative practice assistance in our middle and high schools, um, counselors, social workers, as well as other strategies to improve the services and support available to students, families, and our school teams. 
As a reminder, we also spiraled $24 million each year starting this year through the 23-24 fiscal year to our schools so that principals and their leadership teams can allocate those resources to meet the unique needs of all of the students that they serve. The ESSA 3 process requires updates and additional feedback every six months. So expect some additional updates and requests for input early next year. All right, so we're gonna turn our attention um, to our Metro Schools Reimagined updates. Um, of course, Metro Schools Reimagined encompasses a lot of different strategies to improve student outcomes and strengthen cluster pathways across the district. One aspect is the fifth grade transition from middle school to elementary, which started this school year in the Maplewood, Whites Creek, and Pearl Cone clusters. We know that many families are eager to see this transition occur as soon as possible. So I've asked our team to prioritize this particular aspect or uniform strategy as we call it, of our Metro Schools Reimagined so that we can find cluster pathways where transitioning earlier is feasible and to work with our facilities team to prioritize the investments necessary to bring this to all of our schools by the 24-25 school year. Now at this time, I'd like to welcome up Dr. Elisa Norris, our Executive Officer of Strategy and Performance Management, who has been leading the reimagined work to go over the progress the team has made to accelerate fifth grade transitions across the district. Dr. Norris. Good evening, Chair, Board Members, and Dr. Battle. I appreciate the opportunity to share updates about the great reimagined work that has been ongoing. I'm Elisa Norris, Executive Officer of Strategy and Performance Management with my colleagues, Mr. Ryan Latimer, Director of Boundary Planning and Forecasting, and Ms. Casey Mago, Assistant Director of Facilities Planning and Construction, we will be taking a few moments to celebrate the wins and outline next phases. I'll be providing reimagined updates. Mr. Latimer will share more about the pre-K-5 district configuration, and next phases will be outlined by Ms. Mago. Through Reimagine, we focus on each tier and its role in creating pathways to success for all students. In elementary, great attention is given to setting the proper foundations for continuous academic success and SEL development. Middle school experiences then center on continued student engagement and academic achievement. High school students can expect that they are well prepared for post-secondary success because of the academic achievements and SEL development that they receive throughout their cluster experiences. We start with the end in mind by incorporating in the early grades ready graduate experiences that are strengthened through robust transition plans and supports. Now, I'd like to celebrate the progress that we've made on these uniform strategies around instructional technology, advocacy centers, community achieves, and the pre-K-5 school model that we'll be discussing in greater detail. As a reminder, the reimagined uniform strategies are those that will be used across clusters to set district-wide high expectations for teaching and learning. Because of accelerations in instructional technology, we are now a one-to-one -one district. Our teachers continue to develop innovative strategies in blended learning to accelerate and personalize student learning. All elementary schools now have advocacy centers. Spaces where students can learn regulation skills, which will minimize missed instructional time due to behavioral challenges. Community Achieves will be expanded to more schools so that we are able to link students and families to enrichment opportunities and vital community resources. And we have moved to the pre-K-5 school model in Maplewood, Pearl Cone, and Whites Creek, and are in planning for phase two in Hunters Lane, McGavick, and Stratford. By school year 2022-2023, all elementary schools in the north will have fifth grade. And as we transition to a deeper dive into the pre-K-5 school model, I'd like to <coughs> highlight some of the important reasons for the fifth grade transition. MMPS data show that fifth grade students who remain in the elementary setting outperform their peers who are in the middle school setting. MMPS parents would like their fifth grade students to remain in the elementary setting. State standards are packaged K2, 3, 5, 6, 8, 9, 12, meaning there are certain arcs of learning which follow the contours of these grade bands. Curricular materials written to our state standards also are packaged by these grade bands. And state teaching licensing requirements fall along these grade bands. 
elementary education license is K-5. As a reminder, here are the elementary and middle schools that are involved in the fifth grade transition process during reimagined phase two. I'll pause for a moment for your review of the information previously shared. Along with the elementary schools in Hunters Lane, McGavick, and Stratford, we're accelerating the fifth grade move in the schools listed here on the left. They are Una, Fall Hamilton, Glenview, Woodsett, Charlotte Park, Gower, Carter Lawrence, Aiken, Sylvan Park, Creve Hall, and Norman Binkley. These schools have been selected as acceleration sites because of considerations of available space, capacity, and ease of transition to this school model. And integral to the reimagined framework is a focus on maintaining and strengthening pathways and feeder patterns from elementary to middle school to high school. Margaret Allen, H.G. Hill, West End, and Croft Middle Schools also will be affected by this move. The support hub supports these middle schools as well to ensure that principals have all that they need to transition to the 6-8 school model. Important to note is that in transitioning fifth grade, middle schools are now able to concentrate on one grade band and leverage resources accordingly. Additionally, we have been working with all principals regarding staffing. There will be opportunities for all employees in good standing to retain positions after the fifth grade transition. And now I'd like to transition to Mr. Latimer, who will share more about the pre-K-5 district configuration. Mr. Latimer. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dr. Norris. So the next series of slides will show the enrollment and capacity changes that are taking place with the second phase of the fifth grade transition for the start of the 2022 school year. Uh, the next four slides will follow the same format as this one, and they show uh, the three years of enrollment history, a tentative projection for 22-23 that inc includes the fifth grade remaining in the elementary school. And just a quick note here, uh, with out of zone en for schools with out of zone enrollment, we will be closely monitoring and managing out of zone enrollments with strong preferences given to end zone students in order to avoid potential overcrowding and maintain as close to pl practical ideal learning environments. The next number you see is the school's capacity followed by the projected utilization with these changes. So for example, AMQUI currently has 428 students and with the fifth grade transition, we are expecting enrollment to increase to 493 students. The capacity for the school is 629, which would make the projected utilization 78%. Uh, for the principals following along, it, along, this isn't the final projection, and the projections will change some as we go through the normal process over the next few months. I'm not gonna read through all the changes at every school, but do want to hit on a few highlights. Uh, for the Hunters Lane cluster, 405 students would remain in the elementary tier and increase enrollment in the cluster by 193 students. Uh, for Goodlettsville, the capacity shown reflects what it will be upon completion of their new school. And the same for Old Center, they were recently approved for an addition with ESSER three funding and the capacity of 408 is what it will be upon completion. For the McGavick cluster, 591 students will remain in the elementary tier and increase enrollment in the cluster by 94 students. At this time, we do not anticipate any capacity issues within this cluster. Uh, for Stratford, 187 students will remain in the elementary tier and enrollment will increase by 25 students. I also wanted to point out that uh, Stratford High School serves grades five through 12 currently, and with this change, they will serve grades six through 12. And the last slide on enrollment changes shows the schools where we are going to accelerate the transition of fifth grade. And again, for schools with high out of zone enrollments, we're gonna work to right size enrollment to the point where zoned and out of zone enrollment will fit within the school. 
With the addition of these schools, all clusters within MNPS will have some of their schools in the PK, K5, 6, 8 grade configuration. And my last slide is just a map that shows this transition. This year, we currently have 17 schools shown in green in the PK K5 grade structure. This includes elementary schools in Pearl Cone, Maplewood, and Whites Creek, along with Cane Ridge Elementary, Eagle View, and Cole in the Cane Ridge cluster. We are transitioning another 34 schools shown in yellow for the start of the 2022 school year. There are five schools shown in orange that will transition in 23, and this will complete the Glencliff and Hillwood clusters. The remaining 15 schools in purple will transition in 2024. And once all of the elementary schools have transitioned to a K-5 structure, we will transition our middle magnet schools to a 6-8 feeder path. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Casey. Uh, Ryan just showed you a great map that outlined when we can transition fifth grade back in every elementary school in the district. Most of the schools remaining to transition in the 23, 24, and 24, 25 school years require construction and rezoning to accommodate fifth grade. In the Antioch, Cane Ridge, and Overton clusters, a new school building and rezoning is required to accommodate fifth grade in the remaining cluster schools that were not included in the accelerated phase two transition group that Ryan and Elisa shared with you. We received funding for land and fees for design for the new Antioch Cluster Elementary School, which was awarded in the capital spending plan approved by Metro Council last week. And we also, as Ryan uh, mentioned, the ESSER three funding, we received design money for a new elementary school that uh, is slated for the Overton cluster. And as you saw in the capital improvement budget meeting that we just had like an hour ago, uh, we also are including design fee request and school building request for construction for the Cane Ridge cluster uh, elementary school as well. For the Hillwood and Hillsboro clusters, we need more classrooms, but we don't need so many that we need a new school in the cluster. Both Percy Priest and West Mead have been on the CIB for a prolonged time due to their low facility condition scores. The planned replacement schools will be built larger than they currently are to make space for deficiencies at those schools and to allow for small rezoning efforts in the pathways to accommodate fifth grade in those uh, pathway schools as well. In the CSP that was awarded last week, we received funding for the design of Percy Priest. In the CIB that we reviewed today, we include the funding request for West Mead, uh, the West Mead replacement. For the Glencliff clusters and the optional elementary schools that are not part of the phase two um, transition, out of zone enrollment will be monitored next year to allow for the addition of fifth grade in subsequent school years. Generally, the five new and replacement schools need to follow the same timeline in order to be open for the start of the 24-25 school year, which is the year, as Dr. Battle mentioned, we're striving to complete the fifth grade transition. In 2022, design needs to be completed on these schools. Funding for construction needs to follow closely behind the completion of design so that we can transition directly into construction activities. Construction will progress through 2023 and into 2024. Also in the 23-24 school year, the requir required rezoning plans will need to be completed and approved by the board. The goal of rezoning is to right-size schools to maximize supports and resources and create optimal learning conditions for all students. Um, one final note, and as Ryan concluded his discussion as well, uh, with an eye on equity and access, we plan to transition fifth grade from our magnet middle schools in the same year that we open all elementary schools in the cluster with fifth grade. Again, our goal is for this transition to be completed in, by the start of the 24-25 school year. And now Dr. Norris will discuss the timeline uh, for the phase two transition schools. And finally, here are some important dates connected to the fifth grade transition. December 16th, an informational letter that has been translated will be sent out to families regarding the transitions. January 2022, principals will begin engaging with families regarding the fifth grade transitions. January 24th, 2022, optional schools applications go live. And between March and July 2022, Further communications to parents, both school-based and from the district, with transition tips and reminders and preparation for the coming school year. 
So with that, we'll say thank you, board, for your continued support. <laughs> we appreciate the opportunity to share with you the great work that is happening with Metro Schools Reimagined. And now I'll turn it back to you, Dr. Battle. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Norris, Ryan, Casey. I um, appreciate you providing that update. Um, with that, um, Madam Chair, we'll turn it back over to you. All right, thank you all for that presentation. Do we have any conversation from the board? Go ahead, um, Mrs. Pupo Walker, just let me know if you have others. Thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, I know a lot of parents are eager to see this change. Obviously, would have we have loved to seen it for my own kids, and uh, we know it's it's the right thing to do. I want to salute uh, the logistical effort that is going on here. It is multifaceted. It requires facilities changes, enrollment, zoning changes, transportation changes. It's a it's a huge undertaking, um, and I, I just want to salute your team for doing that. I was wondering if we could talk a little bit about this balance now we're gonna have to do between um, kids who uh, are out of zone, who in elementary schools who lottery in, or, you know, have the choice option, how much of a change will there be in those numbers in order to accommodate this, this move from fifth to elementary? Thank you, Ms. Wibble Walker. Ron Latimer will address your question. Um, you know, kind of as you said, logistically, every school's a little different. So it, it really depends on the school, but overall we'll be offering less choice seats. But if a family's currently out of zone, they'll remain there until they tear out. It won't impact them any. So it would just be the new seats. We would take a few less in some places so that we can accommodate the fifth grade transition without overcrowding the school. Okay, thank you. Ryan. All right, Mrs. Masters and then Mrs. Tyler. Um, so two questions. Um, the first one, I think, is just a clarifying question. So the lottery elementary schools, um, there won't be any effort to add space to those schools, correct? Like we'll add seats as able, but... Yeah, that's correct. We would still just, because they don't serve a zone population, we would just take a few less seats to make room for it. But overall, they would stay about the same enrollment they are now, maybe increase a little bit. And then my second question is, I, I understand it makes a lot of sense to me that Stratford would transition from being a 5 through 12 to being a 6 through 12. So my next question is, MLK being a 7 through 12, what, what is the plan to adjust there? Uh, part of the reason also why magnets are last is that there's some transitions with that that take place. We need to look at and study what's best for the head and the Rose Park feeder <coughs> pathway into MLK with head having fifth and sixth grade, and then there's sixth graders going on to MLK, we need to study that further. Mm -hmm. And then so just kind of need to research a little bit more. Perhaps a good time to eliminate those pathways. Hey. Dana. All right, Mrs. Tyler. Uh, yeah, I want to pivot back to our overview of ESSER three dollars. Um, looking at that 48.8 million to be spiraled directly to the schools, um, I got kind of excited about that because I had been asking about our teachers who've been having to stay late to watch the kids who don't have a bus driver to take them. And um, if you read their MOU, it says that they're not supposed to do that, that the support staff who is paid hourly is supposed to stay with the students after school um, because our teachers don't get any extra pay for that. I was told at the time that that was going to be hard to do because they don't have the money in their school-based budget to expand um, pay for those hourly wage support staff. Now that we have these funds spiraled down, um, are we going to emphasize following the MOU and using support staff for that after-school time and letting our teachers go home at the end of the day? So I'll take that um, question. Um, the first thing is that we do have an MOU with m &EA where our teams are in collaborative conferencing and are talking through um, the conditions that need to be set so that we can um, maximize the expertise and talents um, of, of our teachers. Um, part of that, and I've, I've never been um, on a school team where um, you know there's always this kind of cultural aspect of um, other duties as a sign. I mean, we as educators, we do what's necessary um, to support our students, but to your point with regard 
regards to the funds that are being spiraled to schools. Um, we have only provided um, guardrails to our um, schools around what those funds should be leveraged towards um, to meet the focus outcomes um, of the district. And so um, with that comes empowerment to our school teams to leverage those schools funds as, as needed. We also encourage, just like our school improvement planning process, the engagement of um, leadership teams, instructional leadership teams, and getting um, feedback from the teams to make sure that those investments are leveraged in the space that provide for the outcomes we want and to improve the um, efficiency and effectiveness of, of the school. So we will continue to spiral funds um, to our schools as was um, earlier communicated over the next few years. Um, again, at about the same rate of 24 million per year, which is why you got the $48 million um, dollar total. And um, Dr. Bellamy and team will continue to support principals in leveraging those investments um, to best meet the needs of their schools. That's the purpose, that's the intent. That's why we're not um, centralizing um, all of our funds. We wanted to make sure those funds are closest to um, those who they impact most, our students. Um, and of course, empowering our staff members to do what's best for our students. Okay, I just, that sounds to me like you, um, it's gonna be up to the principal as to how this goes. So I think I would, I would love to hear that there was going to be um, some, at least a little bit more direction about ensuring that our teachers who don't want to stay after or are unable to stay after don't feel um, guilted into doing it or that it's absolutely necessary for them to do it when we already have a plan in place to take care of students who have to stay late, um, that we actually follow that and that we compensate to the people that are going to do it fairly. So, um, yeah, and, and let me be clear, the student-based budgeting process is to equip school teams and communities to do what's best for their learning community. And okay. so there's always this tension between kind of the loose and tight um, around what we want to do, but our goal is empower our leaders to do what's best for their learning communities. And as such, I don't anticipate that it will look the same on any school team. Schools are different sizes, enrollments, times. It's important for the school community to have those discussions and make the appropriate adjustments um, for those extra duties that require us to supervise our students or provide what they need. Okay, all right. So it sounds like we have the ability to directly appeal to a principal as a teacher to say, please make sure that we're following our MOU and that we're asking our support staff to stay like they're supposed to and that we compensate them for their time for staying um, and that we prioritize our teachers' mental health and that we prioritize our teachers' ability to keep doing their job and waking up without feeling burned out so much. So um, that is something you can apparently directly ask of your principals, and I would encourage you to do so. Um, and then I wanted to ask a little bit more about our 48% allocated to accelerate learning process, progress. Um, is that including instructional materials as well? Yes, it is. Okay, so if I remember correctly, I think it was like 18,000 that went directly for instructional materials, just, the, just instructional materials. Million. Million, sorry, I'm so tired. <laughs> We've been here a long time, y'all. <laughs> I mean, that's, that kind of stuck out to me. I was just gonna ask if um, we are including I know that a lot of, a big chunk of that was for our math supplemental, that Kendall Hunt program, and I just wanted to ask a little bit about that. No, the, the math um, investment is for our next adoption uh, process, which includes uh, math. As, as, as a reminder, the state pushed that adoption back two years, and so we are um, proactively planning for that investment so that we can purchase the necessary structural materials when that decision is made. Okay, so that 18 million will not go towards something for now, like the Kindle Hunt group, the Kindle Hunt program that we are currently using in our middle school grades. Um, and we will save it for when we have the new math adoption so that we can then purchase those instructional materials? That's correct. I'm looking over to my team. We've already purchased the materials that are being um, leveraged for this school year. So what you see in that budget is for our upcoming adoption process. Okay. Okay. I think that's it for now. Um, my brain's tired. <laughs> All right, um, Mrs. Elrod, any others? Thank you. 
Okay, um, can you explain what those guardrails are that were given to schools based upon their individual allocations for the two years? All right, I'm gonna invite Dr. Uh, Kerry Randolph off up, our Chief of Strategy, um, and I'll level set here um, that all of our investments um, have a direct alignment to our focused outcomes, but Dr. Kerry. That's right, and um, of course there is, there's pretty broad allowability with ESSER. I think we all know, we've been talking about it for a while, but there are categories under which um, we do have to allocate funds. So just a reminder to all of us, I always have to tell myself this, it is about um, response to and relief from the impact of the pandemic. And so there is accelerating learning. So when we created a guidance document or, um, that watched, that helps schools consider the fiscal cliff for any investments um, that they were considering with their funds. So um, limited ability to add FTEs, for example, without approval because that would not be sustainable in the long term. Um, uh, but then within that, learning loss, right, and learning acceleration are two called out in the legislation. And so uh, we looked at uh, district priorities within that to Dr. Battle's point, focused outcomes. So numeracy, literacy, SEL and transitions. And within that um, created, um, that those were kind of the guardrails, right? Think about these things and supporting um, priorities of the division of schools such as collaborative planning was called out, some of which don't actually require um, funds, but require you know strategic planning um, to put those things in place. So uh, beyond that, um, there, there were some, uh, I would call them inspirational um, pieces as considerations that we had both heard from schools and also knew were allowable um, and fit within um, the vision and the goals of the focused outcomes. So it, would, it, it served a couple purposes, that document, um, and it included um, Tutoring, for example, stipends for tutoring. It included consideration of extended learning opportunities. But within that, it was really up to the school um, to then fall within those buckets of allowability. And those budgets were then um, reviewed because they had to be incorporated into our application for approval by TDOE. And I'll call out on um, oops, slide four, I believe it is. Um, there is a few examples of some of those spirals um, that schools use that align to those buckets that Dr. Randolph just, ex just described. Yes, thank you. Um, on those spirals, can those be changed year to year or do they have to continue to be the same year every year? Yes, they can. They can be changed year to year. And there actually is a process for revising within a school year, just like with SBB or title or other funds. I thought I remembered us having that discussion that they would be able to pivot mm -hmm. if there was a, a change within their school uh, makeup or something along those lines where they could change the usage of those dollars. That's correct. And we're really trying to ground ourselves in um, return on investment. So we want to constantly be in our continuous improvement um, cycle to make sure the investments we're making are having the impact that we um, intended with those uh, particular strategies. My next question, thank you, Carrie, or Dr. Randolph, is um, about our reimagined work. I know we will have some very excited uh, school populations, myself included, um, that will be quite happy about the fifth grade being accelerated to next year. Um, they will be notified, it's my understanding, via email, or not email, but mail, United States Postal Service, starting tomorrow, and then schools will start communicating it as well. Um, is there any additional information that will be provided to those students um, whether it's to those elementary schools or to the middle schools that are impacted. Yes, ma'am. Um, there will be additional communications. We've learned a lot about the transitions of getting back into our K-5 configuration. Um, and so we have um, several resources that we'll be providing given those learnings and um, the impact that this transition will have on our students. Dr. Norris, do you mind responding? Absolutely. Thank you so much for the question. So lessons learned from the last time we transitioned. We are sending out the letter, certainly. We're creating a video that will be posted on the Reimagine website, our page, that will talk specifically about what parents can expect, what parents parents need to do in preparation for the transition. And additionally, we are meeting with all the principals who lead the schools that will be affected by this transition. We meet with them weekly and we talk about what kind of communications do you need? How can we support you from the support hub? And we are pivoting and ensuring that they have all the documentation that they that they need to communicate this out to their community and their parents. Can you speak briefly about the FAQ? Oh, absolutely. And additionally, we have several FAQs. We have an FAQ that is um, 
finalized and it's for faculty and staff. We are also working on an FAQ for parents. Every, every question that we learned from last time, we're capturing in documents so that we can share it with our community members. And there is a dedicated website uh, for Metro Schools Reimagine? There is a dedicated website. Anyone interested, please visit this, the district's website and, and search for Reimagine. And we have all the information, including the transition with Maplewood, Pearl Cone, and Whites Creek, and additionally, phase two and what that looks like. Excellent. I'm glad to know that we're doing FAQs that are separate for each different yes. stakeholder population. So I think that information will be needed. And then lastly, regarding our reimagined work, um, a co popular conversation that we hear is about uh, school start times. And I know that it has been needed for some time, but a necessary part to that um, to start that process was moving a lot of these schools and creating these new pathways. So is our priority after this happens in 2026 to then have that conversation? We, um, are, we have prioritized the transition, the uniform strategy of transition in fifth grade back to elementary school. Um, after we are, um, and I, I won't say completely after, we're gonna kind of start some of the work before we um, finish that last transition year, the 24-25 year. But certainly, um, our study around start times is a part of our Metro Schools Reimagine. Um, that is the next priority um, after we get our uniform strategies addressed in, in this specific space. Um, so addressing and support our elementary and middle schools. May I make sure I understand that correctly? So we're gonna to continue to move schools according to this phase plan that we have here and the very helpful map. Thank you, Mr. Latimer. Um, you're so gifted at the maps. Uh, so I appreciate all those maps to help us best understand it and communicate it with our constituent bases. So as we continue to do that, particularly as we have a couple years work, not just next year's phases, we're gonna coincide also doing this study on start times and what's the best option. Will those studies also include you know, parent feedback and other stakeholders outside of the support hub. Yes, I mean, I, th I think if we think about this with the fifth grade transition process, I mean, we got a lot of feedback. Uh, we had town halls, we got surveys. I mean, enough information uh, for me as a director to say this is something that our stakeholders are really desiring for us to shift. And then there's a lot of um, academic research, social emotional learning research that um, helps support that. So in a similar fashion, uh, we begin the conversation around um, start times and what that looks like. I, I cannot predict the outcome. Um, of that, but it is important for us to have the conversation um, so that we can make the best informed decision for Metro National Public Schools um, and our entire community. So um, this is a part of, and we've already identified this as a priority under Metro Schools Reimagine, but it will definitely include stakeholder feedback. There's lots of data and research that's already out there. We'll be digging further into that to make um, the best decision at that time. Thank you. I appreciate hearing that. I'm, I'm glad that it's going to be in it together um, as we continue to make those plans and we move students through the different grade levels and different clusters. Thank you. All right, any other questions? Student board members or others? I don't mean to call you all out. Okay, all right. Uh, well, thank you, Dr. Battle and team for your presentation. Uh, we look forward to more updates. I appreciate the focus on equity and making sure that our historically and generationally disenfranchised communities got that shift first, making sure that we reallocated dollars in a way that really supported families and students that hadn't got that investment. So we appreciate that. And can, if you don't mind, um, because I do need to give a thank you to the team, um, particularly in this <coughs> acceleration space. Um, we took this opportunity, particularly with the disruptions caused by the pandemic, to try to accelerate this uniform strategy. We know that Metro Schools Reimagine is not only about um, transition to fifth grade back, um, but the team has taken it on, just understanding the importance and the impact it can have on our students. So thank you um, to our MMPS um, team who um, is meeting daily, weekly, um, to make this um, a reality for our students students and families. Thank you all. And with that, we move to an even more important or just as important portion of our uh, meeting where we hear from the community during public participation. So you all were asked to sign up by 12 o'clock on Monday. Your names are listed above. You'll have three minutes. At the end of the, the three minutes, which will be on the clock, you will hear this sound and we will ask you to complete your sentence, submit any final thoughts to the board in writing or even via phone call. You can find our information on the MNPS website. So with that, I would like to call the first three people. Feel free to just be ready when you see your name coming up. Billy Savage Short. All right, Laura Leonard. Eric Warfield. Yes, Billy Savage Short, please come on up. 
Um, I had, sorry, I'm Billy Savage Short, and I live at 2880 Creek Bend Drive. And I want to talk about um, the gender identity that you guys have placed in the schools. And gender comes from our almighty creator, doesn't come from our feelings, doesn't come from what we think it looks like. But we are assigned that, and you guys have, are placing that within our school system, within the wit and wisdom curriculum. And um, also, that's regarding to critical race theory as well. Our skin color does not identify us. It is a mere description of the melanin or the lack of melanin that God has blessed us with. So as far as the, um, the gender unicorn that you guys are wanting to implement throughout the elementary schools, um, it's, it's really disturbing. Um, once again, your identity doesn't come from what you think it is. Um, it does come from our Heavenly Father. And so I would ask you to reevaluate what you guys are doing with as far as teaching children or gender. That's not your job. That's the parent's job. And so I'm asking you to rethink that. Also, no mask. There is not a peer-to-peer -peer scientific review that says masks are effective. You guys are following political science and not observational or experimental science. Thank you. It's Thank great. you. Laura Leonard. Eric Warfield. Jeremiah Wooten. Hello. Um, first, just to respond to Dr. Battle from earlier, late buses are not a, a school issue. That's an administrative issue. So while I appreciate Ms. Tyler advocating for teachers, that funding should not come from school-based budgeting. That should come from you all because you are the reason that you have not hired appropriate bus drivers, right? Staffing issue is not a school-based budgeting at the district level like that. Um, so I spoke with you all last month about grading and I am happy to, to say teachers did receive grading information several weeks before the second quarter grading deadline, which is a much preferred timeline to ours as it has been the last three times. So thank you for that and I hope that continues. This month I wanna speak kind of in support of our new math curriculum. Um, adopting the Kindle Hunt Illustrative Mathematics as a supplementary resource um, last fall was a phenomenal choice. Uh, it's an open source curriculum, it's digital first, so it was really a lot easier to implement than kind of a traditional textbook when we were in the virtual environment. And this year we're able to see that these print resources and hands-on manipulatives also really help promote high quality instruction. So um, it's also a curriculum that's received the highest rating of any math curriculum by Ed Reports. And um, we've been provided with lots of helpful training. I even got the opportunity to participate in a modeled lesson during a PLC um, from one of our district math coaches, Amber Thanell, and that's been very helpful for us. So I applaud the district's director of mathematics, Jessica Slayton, for her leadership and really all the math department and coaches for a great job implementing that. So um, they truly have lived up to that name of the support hub, and I hope other departments will do that as well. As we begin this next adoption process, I will definitely continue to advocate for this curriculum. Next, I want to talk quickly about charter schools. Well, I appreciate the strong talk from you all. Um, I would encourage you to put your money where your mouth is and make changes to how metro government buildings are leased to charter schools. In a recent Metro Council Planning and Zoning Committee, um, David Prophet shared how only recently did MNPS realize that they need council approval to lease out metro government property, which is Interesting, but I digress. Um, the reason I'm sharing this is because by sending these leases in front of Metro Council, these leases are being made available to the public. And we can see how little these buildings are being leased for. Well under market value, in one case less than $5 a square foot for these buildings. So I'm curious why we have this big talk about charter schools are siphoning money away from MMPS schools when the leases that you all approve are actively giving away this money to charter schools by charging them below market rent for buildings that we own. So I urge you to look into these leases and make sure they are protecting the interests of MPS. And since I saw earlier council member um, Rosenberg here, I will add thank you to him for continuing to advocate for MPS schools and our funding. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Morgan Phillips. Hello, my name is Morgan Phillips. I live in District 4. Um, thank you for having me tonight and giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, so I am a junior at McGavick High School and I wanted to talk about the mental health of our students. 
Um, according to the CDC, more than one in three high school students have experienced persistent feelings of sadness, hopelessness. Um, in 2019, a 40% increase from 2009. Um, also in 2019, approximately one in six youth reported making a suicide plan, a 44% increase from 2009. And ages 10 to 24, suicide is the third leading cause of death with an average of, let's see, 5,400 suicide attempts every day just by seventh to 12th graders, so sorry. To every parent, this should be at least a little concerning. So many stresses for students with so little support, things like deadlines, tests, bullying, among other problems with family and friends. So unless you have insurance or a lot of extra money to spend, you don't get good mental health support. Um, most schools have guidance counselors, but I don't think those should be stand-ins for uh, mental health professionals. Sorry, I'm trying to my best to breathe here. <laughs> Take your time. Um, in my own experience, um, the best that I've gotten from a school guidance counselor is a very awkward conversation where they sit there and smile at me and at the end they tell me to come talk to them again if I have more trouble when they didn't give me any advice or actual counseling in the first place. To give everybody a sense of scale, in 2018, MPS spent $3,259,000 on security and for a sense of scale, $784,700 on social emotional learning, which if I'm being totally honest, I don't remember seeing in my classroom almost at all. And it's something that I believe that should be implemented and mandatory so that me and my peers know how to deal with our emotions and know that we have someone that cares. Um, I know that I might just be a name on somebody's, spe on somebody's spreadsheet, so sorry, but I refuse to let myself, my student, my student peers, and my friends become a statistic. So thank you for your time. Thank you. <laughs> Kelly Phillips. Good evening, how's everybody doing? My name's Kelly Phillips. I live in District 4. My address should be on file, and that was my daughter, and I'm very proud of her for getting up and speaking tonight. I think she has some important topics that we need to pay attention to. Something that you hold fixed or firmly that you stand by, no matter what, is called a conviction. In most, in most people's lives, a conviction is something that they stand by no matter what, no matter what the circumstance, no matter the people involved. Our kids are being told again that they need to keep masks on, which is fine. That's what you all have chosen to do. Well, most of you have voted on. <clears throat> Even though outside those school buildings, the rest of the world, for the most part, has gone back to normal. And, and I would assume that in some of your personal lives, when you're outside that school building, you might venture to not wear a mask when you go out to do something as well. When we choose to take convictions and impose them on other people, it means that we hide them, uh, that we hold them in high regard. And continuing to keep these kids in masks, I would assume that everyone on the school board that voted for that holds these masks as a conviction and that they're doing something to protect our children, not knowing the long-term health aspects of it, mental, physical, any of it. So let's talk about what happens when we don't follow through on that and we go against what we tell others to do. Good for thee, not for me. That's called hypocrisy. When we have on masks, we don't get to see smiles. Oh. Two of you ladies have some really pretty smiles. Dr. Battle was at Hillwood High School. I like to call this the urban variant. When Keith Urban was there, he talked to a classroom full of students and he didn't have to wear a mask and neither did anybody in his entourage. And when he was done, he got a picture with Dr. Battle. She didn't have on a mask either. We don't get to see Dr. Battle's pretty smile. Miss Bugs went to something in October. She was here, I guess, enjoying a good time with friends or family. She posted it on her Instagram. You have a beautiful smile. I wish we could see it. Because when you're out on your own, you did not wear the mask. Guys, our kids need to be able to see each other smile. I have a three-year-old, well, he's almost three, 
If it continues this way, he's gonna grow up going to a school system where he's not gonna get to see a smile of his peers during the day. It's not acceptable. Y'all got to smile. We got to see your smile. Let our kids smile. Let them smile. If you want your kids to wear a mask, and the only reason I'm not talking to y'all is because they need to hear too. If you want your kids to wear a mask, wear a mask. If you don't, that's your choice. Thank let you. Let your kids have the chance to smile like they do, okay? Amy Pate. <laughs> I'm speaking tonight to draw attention to issues parents are concerned with. Last meeting, there was a long discussion of the parent portal, but parents don't care about the portal because it doesn't tell us anything we don't know. It's like a doctor saying, yes, your cholesterol is 200 points too high, but then refusing to give us any medicine. We see the problems. We need the remedy. One remedy is returning fifth grade to elementary district-wide. You've shown you have the ability to make it happen. You have a large staff of six-figured paid employees whose job it is to make it happen, but you refuse to put fifth in my daughter's elementary school, although it is possible. You said all fifth grades would be in elementary next year, but they're not. You said you would only move schools by cluster, but you're not. You said moving fifth was about equity, but it's not. Next year, the richest elementary school in Metro in Miss Bugs area will have fifth grade while many others won't. I'm glad they have fifth grade because all fifth graders should have equal access to the advocacy centers, extra guidance counselors, and self-regulation rooms you've put in elementary. Next year's fifth graders spent their third grade year mostly virtual due to your bad decisions and COVID closures. You spent hours last meeting arguing over charter school students. Ms. Elrod voted against them because it wasn't fair they got fifth in elementary and not the rest of her district. No, it's not fair. But instead of denying what's best for certain students, why not demand the best for all students? Another remedy is later high school start times. This own board has said repeatedly that high schoolers would benefit from later start times like magnet and charter schools, yet you refuse to discuss it. Why? Another remedy is optional masking. We have pediatric vaccines. That was always the goalpost to allow mask optional, yet there's no discussion of it. If you're worried that COVID rates will increase, I urge you to look at every county around us and most of the private schools in town, like the one Mayor Cooper sends his kids to, which have been mask optional for months. They have no higher rates of COVID than MNPS. Optional masking allows speech delayed, English language learners, sensory disorders, emerging readers, and hearing impaired kids to learn more easily. It takes the burden off teachers to constantly redirect behavior. It makes schools more equitable because some kids get in trouble constantly for their masks while others don't. Another remedy is intensive tutoring. You have a virtual only volunteer tutoring program. It's not enough. Students first, that's the remedy. If students' needs were first, fifth grade would be in elementary, high school would start later, mass would be optional, there would be tutoring. MNPS has the very best teachers, but they're hamstrung at every turn. Buses don't get to school on time, you don't let parents in to volunteer, you can't keep security staff because they're mistreated, and you can't keep students because enrollment is dropping. You continue focusing on things that don't matter, like the parent portal, and ignore those that do. I have faith that you can do better. Give us the remedy, now. Sarah Sagan. My name is Sarah Siegand. I am the mom of two MMPS students. I live in District 2. I am one of many parents who are calling for the end of our mask mandate. If parents knew the actual COVID data buried in the nonsensical weekly MMPS reports, they would realize it's high time for policy change. The fact that MMPS deliberately displays this data in the most useless way possible reveals that there is an agenda that favors politics, not science. For example, last year we could download our weekly data as a PDF. This year, it's displayed in a non-savable format. They know this. They're counting on us not keeping track. So parents are taking screenshots. Last week, only one-tenth of 1% 1 of our students tested positive. That means 99.9% .9 did not have COVID, but we made them cover their faces for seven hours with cloth or paper just in case. 
80 of our schools, well over half, posted zero cases last week. Another 46 of them were between one and four. Our most vulnerable students have remarkably low case rates. Harris Hillman Special Education School has 450 students, many of whom could be classified as medically vulnerable. They have had as few as 10 student cases all year and have been zero for almost half of the semester. We have 541 kids across four dedicated pre-K schools. They have had to cover their tiny faces for six hours a day, yet their schools have all been mostly zero every single week with a total semester case count as low as 15. Cambridge Early Learning Center has had zero cases all year long. Why are we masking our preschoolers? <coughs> A month ago, I was missing a week of data, so I inquired to Student Health Services for the archive of the report. When I eventually received a response, I was told by the director that she didn't have access to those numbers, and it would be a bit of a process to get me what I needed. Keep in mind, the information I was asking for had just been on the website, and this is the department responsible for reporting and analyze, analyzing the data that's supposed to inform our district-wide COVID policies like masks. This is unacceptable. MMPS is in a credibility crisis. Where is the accountability? While I disagree with the conclusions of the Sixth Circuit ruling about mandates, this note from it stuck out. School policies should be regularly reviewed, especially school transmission data, and adjusted to align with new information about the pandemic. It's time to join over 140 other school districts in our state by making masks optional so kids and teachers can engage in learning without hindrance. Thank you. Thank you. Leonella Tamayo. Oh, I'm sorry. Naraj to here. Naraj. All right, Leonella Tamayo. Chadwick, Germany. Good evening to the chair and uh, members of the board. My name is Chadwick, Germany and I live in Mount Juliet, and I work at the Great School of Knowledge Academy. I'm very excited for the opportunity to be here to speak to you on behalf of the school. Uh, I want to talk about two things. One, I am the athletic director, and I am also the college career readiness coach. Two jobs that I hold that I am very, very passionate about. Uh, as athletic director, we went out first and we, we, we got the weight room and the weight room has been a tremendous uh, asset for the students. So we thank the board from NEI, the board, for approving that and making that happen because it's been a huge difference in athletics for our students. One, for injury prevention and also to help them to build confidence that translates not just on the basketball court, but also in the classroom. We also, we went out and hired the best basketball coach in the country and he brought along a good staff and uh, we hadn't won a game in two years, and right now we're having great success in sports and basketball. And also, we implemented grade sheets. So all of our athletes turn in weekly grade sheets, and that is to ensure that we keep them above a 3.0, that's the goal, and also a 21 on the ACT, because we do encourage college, which ties to the college career readiness uh, position that I hold, which we take our students to visit MTSU, TSU, uh, Lipscomb, Vanderbilt, and our students are very, very, very excited about going on these college campuses. And after they attend these visits, they write a one to two page report. And if you guys were able to read some of the things that they say about the visits that they take, uh, it kind of brings tears to your eyes when you read stuff that students are talking about when they weren't thinking that they could go to college, didn't believe and had never been on a college campus and you, you, you see the change in their lives. And I think that's what we all are about as educators, you know, to have a place that we can send our kids or have a place that we can work. And I get up at four o'clock every morning and I can't wait to get on, the, get on the road to get to Knowledge Academy. So when you have a school like that, we ask that you will vote on our behalf to help keep the charter so that we can keep the fire lit and keep inspiring, motivating, and changing lives at 5320. Hickory Hollow Parkway. Thank you. Thank you. 
Elgin Bynum. Nicole Bynum. Gyro Matos Lopez. I'm so sorry for butchering your name. Uh, good evening, uh, chair members and members of the board. Uh, my name is Jairo Matos, and I'm a senior at Knowledge Academy. And I can still remember the day I first walked through the, the, those doors. I was a uh, lost Cuban boy in a new country. I had not a drop of English. I had not, a, not one friend. And I just felt totally alienated. But the first day I walked through those doors, within the first hour, I had found something special. I had found something that I didn't think I was going to find. And that year, that first year, those, those teachers, those students, those walls saw me being able to have a full conversation in English, saw me find people who cared for me, who felt for me, saw me become, become one more. And, but with time, I, I, I left the school, I went to others, and I was, I was happy. But in the middle of my high school career, I felt with, I, I didn't feel a calling. And I was concerned. I felt no home, I felt no calling. I was, I was concerned what's gonna happen once I leave high school. So I went to the first home that I remember having. I went back to Knowledge Academy. And I, there I realized my calling. I, I, I got the skills. I, I got an education, I got leadership skills, I, 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 and I realized that what I wanted, what I wanted to do. And this, this June 6th, I'll be uh, shipping out and, and start my training as a U.S. Army soldier. And <laughs> thank you. And it is, it is my school. It is this logo that made me a tiger, that made me a fighter, that made me someone that learns from, their, from, from every time they fall down, that a person that learns from hard times. And I, and I will live my life, and I will do my years of service, but I want to come back to my school, and I want to go back to those doors, and I want to see another child, and I want to look at myself in him and, and say, you're going places because I was able to. I was able to, because of my school, I was able to accomplish what I've accomplished to this day, thanks to this logo, thanks to those teachers, thanks to those walls. And I'm forever grateful. I'm forever grateful for, to be a, a knowledge tiger. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for your future service. Uh, Hinat Tillahan. Hello. Good evening, chair members of the board. My name is Hinat Tillahan, and I'm a freshman at Knowledge Academy. I have been attending KA since the fifth grade. KA is a school of many opportunities. I've been offered jobs, volunteers, and many more. Unlike many other schools that I have seen and been to, the staff and administration generally care. People like Coach Germany, Dr. Germany, Coach Ellington, Ms. Bing, Mr. MJ, and Mr. Lewis, just to name a few off the top of my head. I've had staff members go out of their way to give me opportunities that the school could not offer, such as giving me the chance to go to a private Christian school to take AP Human Geography. As you would know, that isn't common in most schools. My parents being immigrants coming, here to, out of, coming to this country wanted the best for me. If I could go back and choose to go to KA, I would choose to do so. I believe my parents made a good decision because I feel as if KA is the best for me. Even during rumors and quote unquote scandals, this school has stood strong and remained. During the pandemic, KA was the second school to open during the virus. With the protocols that were followed, no student was harmed from the virus that following year. K 
Kay has treated me and many more students amazing. It is a school that is friendly to all cultures, sexualities, identities, and religions. This is a school that needs to stay in Tennessee. Please con consider us. I hope you vote in favor for our renewal. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Cedric Clark. Good evening, board, chair, and members of the board. My name is Cedric Clark. I'm a junior at Knowledge Academies. I've been attending Knowledge Academies since fifth grade, and we came a long way, and I'm so proud. Uh, K feels like home to me. I love how I can bond with people and teachers, staff. They help me grow as a person in and out of school. Um, teachers, they always want students to be at their top ability, and they want everybody to be reach their highest potential. The people on Knowledge Academy is like a big family. Uh, we welcome everyone who wants to join. We try to encourage people outside of Knowledge Academies and any our community to come and support the school. They, they encourage people to um, always be active and always be in their community. A good example is our Nissan Stadium fundraisers. They always got people come in to support Knowledge Academies. Uh, lastly, I love how they prepare me for college. Um, we had multiple college tours, counselors to come speak, even a military recruiter came to talk about military path. Before then, I wasn't so sure if I wanted to go to college. I was skeptical about it. I thought it was too much, and I didn't know what to do. But now that I got that work and researching that program, I now know what I want to do and what college I want to attend. Um, that's all I have. Thank you for your time and opportunity to speak. Please vote in favor to renew our charter. Thank you. Uh, LaSalle Chapman Curry. Good evening, Chair and members of the board. I'm LaSalle Chapman Curry, Hermitage, Tennessee, and I'm also a member of the Knowledge Academy team in middle school special education. An educator's role is often overlooked, undervalued, and sometimes it feels to be underappreciated. To work with such dedicated professionals day in and day out is quite rewarding, and this has been my experience since joining the Knowledge Academy team. The K staff has determined that our student success starts with us. Each morning, we greet our young scholars with a warm smile, followed by good morning and occasional fist bump. These may seem like small gestures, however, they set the tone for the day. KA has a diverse student population which represents our community. Some may say that we are an extended family. It would be devastating if KA was not an educational option in Antioch and its surrounding areas. During COVID and post-COVID, we witnessed both academic and social challenges. Fear of the unknown, virtual settings, and return to the classroom seemed like an impossible task. As a parent and educator, I would be remiss to not take the time to thank the leadership at NEI for making this transition less daunting. Despite the challenges, I'm also proud to say that through it all, we managed to achieve a 100% graduation rate. As we foster relationships with our young scholars, providing educational outlets as well as extracurricular activities are essential in providing the building blocks for success. I currently serve as the faculty advisor for our Student Government Association, and when I say that the campaign trail leading up to Super Tuesday, which was our KA election day, was full of energy and excitement, that would be somewhat of an understatement. This is the energy that makes school more than just a school. Additionally, we have the Student Advisory Council, which meets monthly with our principal, and our Student Advisory Council, along with the SGA, are not only the organizations that exist at KA. We currently have and are currently chartering the Beta Club, Golden Key Honor Society, Anime, um, Robotics, the Reptile Club, FBLA, Cheerleading, Basketball, Soccer, Super Skills, Conditioning, and Weightlifting, as Coach Germany mentioned earlier. Student involvement and leadership will assist in preparing our young scholars for the future that will need them. It goes without saying that I love our KA family and I'm personally committed to our success. 
I wish to have many more years in doing so, as my hopes that our charter is renewed. Thank you for your time, and let's go Tigers. Thank you. Brad Martin. Lisa Vale. Jasmine Black. Good evening, board. My name is Jasmine Black. I'm from Bellevue, Tennessee, and I am the Family Engagement Representative at Knowledge Academies. I've been a staff member at KA for about a year, and I've been involved in Knowledge Academy um, for about two years. Growing up, I um, lived with a family full of educators, and I thought I'd seen it all. But when I started working at a uh, charter school, specifically Knowledge, I realized I had messed out on a vital part of being an educator that's giving families the right to choose. Parents wanna be a part of their child's education. Knowledge gives that opportunity to be a part of every aspect of their children's education. From the curriculum, to being able to be a volunteer just to um, walk around in the halls. Working as a family engagement rep here has given me the unique perspective of getting to know the families and students' needs uh, and the community needs us as much as we need them. Outside of our regular curriculum, we offer the food pantry, coats for our kids, and clothes, and a safe space for our children of greater Antioch area just to come and simply hang out and play basketball in the evenings. Knowledge gives our families a great opportunity to be a part of their scholars' education in a way that is not offered anywhere else. And I would love for their right to choose Knowledge Academies to remain. Thank you for your time. Thank you. James Locke. Good evening, Chair and members of the board. My name is James Locke, and I am currently in my junior year of high school, and I've been a student at Knowledge Academy since my fifth grade year. It is my honor to stand before you to advocate for my school. Imagine going back in time to when you were leaving the safety of elementary school and beginning your journey to middle and high school. Although excitement may be predominant, predominant to other emotions, a semblance of fear and concern is definitely present. I had many qualms in regards to such a foreboding environment. All the horror stories and all the how to survive middle and high school videos did wonders on my perception of my educational future. If I were to go back in time to 12-year-old me, I would tell him that although his qualms are warranted, he is about to embark on the greatest adventure that surpasses all his expectations, meet new people who will push him to unbelievable heights, and truly embrace himself as the first LGBTQ plus member of his lineage. My first steps into Knowledge Academies have greeted me to the greatest family I could ever be a part of. Students and staff from the community form a community that works together to ensure growth all across the student body. Everyone, both new and former, endeavor to raise one another to heights inconceivable to others. Even when faced with the threat of termination and the pandemic, Knowledge Academies display tenacity and continue to fulfill their mission to prepare students to make the best academic and social choices, leading to a successful life connected to college community creativity and culture. I intend to uphold this mission, for I would not be the student standing before you had I not been influenced by their mission. For the past seven years, I have grown alongside Knowledge Academies and seen how much it has surpassed its own limits. This development and growth has proved to me that everyone is capable of improvement. As of now, I see so much potential for us, potential to provide, to refine, and to once again surpass our limits. If this potential energy is released, I can only imagine what pathways we can open for us and our future students. I thank you for your magnanimity and hope you will vote in favor of our charter renewal. Thank you. Thank you. Mahir Malik and then Carol Shahata. Good evening, Chair and members of the board. My name is Carol Shahada, and I am a junior at Knowledge Academies. I have attended the school since my freshman year, and I am currently the chief editor of our news team. Over this past year, we have gained a significant, significant increase in supporters and sponsors. These sponsors have also opened more opportunities for students and to grow as a whole. 
As word spreads of our president of our presence, more more staff joins our school. The influx of new staff members allows more ideas and more programs to be added to our school, such as new sports teams and clubs. Students' involvement has increased due to more opportunities presented to them. Knowledge academies have strived to provide more student-run pro projects, such as international affairs, but they expect to add more projects meant for the student body. Knowledge Academies has also strived to provide students with more college opportunities to better their chances of a successful future. Thank you for your time and I hope you vote in favor of our Tara Renewal. Thank you. Thank you. Isaac August Augustine. Good evening, Chair and members of the board. My name is uh, Isaac Augustine, and I'm currently a junior in Knowledge Academies. I've been um, at the school since I was in the sixth grade, and I have never seen such a school put the time and effort into the students. I've never seen such a staff so caring and... Oh, shoot, sorry. You're doing fine. You're good. good. and loving into the students. <laughs> uh, I remember when I went to the school and uh, one year I felt like trash, but this school helped me learn that everybody can care about you and that you aren't nobody, but you are somebody that you can be someone special and that the world can accept you for who you are. I've been able to join the basketball team even though I didn't have confidence in making the team. I've been able to make many friends and, and be able to relate to them and be able to have great times. Even though it's past years with COVID, I've been able to stay happy because of the school. I've been able to stay happy because the teachers and staff care about you and they don't leave you alone. They want you to be happy and they want you to achieve something greater than you can be for right now. They want you to be the person that everyone can look up to. And they want you to be that special someone that can represent the school and represent the generations to come, from your kids to your grandkids and maybe even your great-grandkids. That's how much I believe this school can prosper. That's how much I believe that this school can help many other generations beyond. So thank you for listening and please support the school and our charter renewal. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Markiana Sparks. Good evening, chair and members of the board. My name is Markiana Sparks, and I'm a junior at KA. This is my first year at KA. When I first got to KA, I thought it was going to be full of stuck-up students, and the teachers were just going to throw work in my face. <laughs> I never have been to a charter school, so I really didn't know what to expect. But once I got to know the school itself and the students and teachers, I noticed how the, students actually, the teachers actually care about the students. Now, all they do is try to create opportunities opportunities for the students to push them to do their best. This is the first school out of three high schools that has actually took me on college trips and helped me find out what I really want to do with my life. The school, the, the students at KA are a big community and that is something that we want to keep around. Thank you for your time. Please vote in favor to renew our charter. Thank you. Chuck Moore. Hi, hey, members of the board. I'm going to talk on behalf of Knowledge Academies. Uh, about a, a little more than a decade ago, um, I was at a meeting with uh, some of people in this room at the top of the Pinnacle Building. Uh, 
I was an Academy partner then uh, with the help to, in the very first uh, launch of the Academy system. On that first day, we had the Academies. Uh, I joined as an Academy partner because I thought we could help create, you know, engaging and original programs for students. About four years ago, I joined the team at Knowledge Academies for the same reason. I wanted to create engaging, original content. Uh, when the NEI team came in, uh, I wasn't sure what to think about them. I don't think they knew what to think about me either at the time. <laughs> but we extended a little trust to each other, a little grace to each other, and we set about making up some really great things. Um, we've totally uh, modernized and revamped the general business program. Uh, we've now launched a music business pathway as well. Uh, that started this year. We've got a recording studio under construction. Our student-run record label is going to be launching next year. Um, we're outperforming every other school in our cluster. Uh, our enrollment is up by more than 10% this year. So I'm left wondering why we're even debating whether the school needs to have a renewal or not. You know, every school in the area is, you know, filled to capacity. We're increasing our enrollment, you know, and why would we talk about not renewing the charter of one of the higher performing schools in that cluster? That's just, that, that's baffling to me why we're even talking about it. Thank you. Thank you. James Franklin Spencer. Did they even notice the middle school up for renewal? Good evening. Um, just wanted to say the cat's out the bag. Um, we had a parent tonight come up here and say that we can't keep security staff. I didn't really need to come and say it. She said it. We cannot keep security staff. Why? No one wants to work under the current administration. No one wants to work under the current ED administration. Got people leaving. Just as of today, you had a person transfer out of our department. He's been in the district a minute. He's going to transportation. I mean, that's cool. We keep in the body. But ask him why he's leaving. Ask him why he's leaving. Ask him why he wants to transfer out. Just as of today, we short-staffed already six. Go on the MNPS website. Six people. So that's number seven. Then come to find out there's an officer that's under investigation of something frivolous, really. Something that can be fixed through the district, through the EAP program. Not giving that opportunity. He's on the chopping block now to be gone, to be terminated used to be part of somebody's family sitting up here at their school, high school. Yeah, he's on the chopping block to leave. Um, I even got pulled into the office under investigation. On what? On what? I got the evidence. I got the conversation. I got it on video. If you're interested, I can provide it. What happened to that investigation? Nothing. Nothing. Nothing at all. It was a waste of my time. It was a waste of the people's time that tried to pull me into the office and investigate me. Our security department is in a world of hurt right now. As of January, when we come back to school, it's going to be about eight people gone. Fred Kemper's gone. Dog program, 40 years, experience, gone. Steve Keel, retiring, gone. Ask him why he's gone. I think you have uh, Fred Kemper's letter. I think you have it. Yes. The security department is in disarray. Thank you. 
Gwen Johnson. Bethany Riddle Johnson. Good evening, Chair, members of the board. My name's Bethany Riddle Johnson, and I live on Lone Oak Road in Jeannie Poopoo Walker's district. I am also an MNPS parent and a college professor. And first, I want to thank you for your strong support of universal masking to keep our children safe, based on a lot of peer-reviewed studies, and for supporting all gender identity so that all of our children feel welcome and safe. But tonight, I am here with the NOAA's Education Task Force. We are here to recognize and advance black brilliance, asserting the need for equitable access and support for advanced academics for all MNPS students, regardless of their race, ethnicity, or zip code. We all agree that it's the right of every child, regardless of their race, ethnicity, or place of residence within M uh, Davidson County, to access a challenging curriculum to help them grow academically. Indeed, an MNPS core tenant is to identify and eliminate inequities, and one of the MNPS core values is excellence, which embodies the belief that all students benefit from high quality instruction and high expectations each year in each subject and in each classroom. As an educator myself, I know the advantages of at, ad, uh, blah, sorry, advanced academics, and I know how to navigate the school system to ensure that my children have access to them. But I've had to figure this out myself, and not all families know of the many benefits of advanced academics or how to access them. I know that MNPS is setting this as a priority, but it's essential that you work um, to further communicate regularly with families regarding all of the advanced academic offerings, their benefits, their qualifications for the programs, who to contact about enrollment, and actions parents or guardians can take to help their students meet criteria for enrollment. Further, current, currently students, er, ac, sorry, students early post-secondary opportunities in MNPS high schools depends on their zip code with large discrepancies across schools as highlighted in the Tennessean today. Thus, MNPS must earmark dollars to expand advanced academic opportunities in schools serving the most black and Latino students who are currently underserved. And so in closing, we must work together to address the inequities in advanced academics that get us to the MNPS core tenant to identify and eliminate inequities. Thank you. Thank you. Lorraine Stallworth. Um, Council, oh, yeah. Skip. I skipped who? Made it. Never mind. Never mind. Never mind. Never mind. Council Member Dave Rosenberg. Jeez, my shirt doesn't. It's been a long day. Good evening, <laughs> Madam Chair, members. Uh, thank you all for your continued service during these challenging times. Um, <laughs> while it's great to see you tonight, uh, it gives me no pleasure to speak. I'm a public school evangelist and have consistently supported MNPS in any way I've known how. Sadly, I'm here to share some things going on at one of our middle schools. Imagine a middle school where a white student steals a soccer ball from a black student, says, suck my D, you stupid blank blank N-word, and the principal brings the black child into his office and tells the victim that since the offender wasn't looking him in the eye when he said it, there's a way of knowing if he was the target or a middle school where lockdowns occur without any notification to teachers and parents, lockdowns that lead students to fears of being in the middle of a school shooting, only to expose other students to the trauma from the drug dogs that are brought in and pat downs that take place in the hall, or a middle school where non-consensual sexual incidents go unpunished and are never even entered into the system or a middle school where this represents barely the tip of the iceberg of what we know to say nothing of stories from those who don't know how to reach their elected officials. That's Bellevue Middle School. Families have been leaving. Teachers have complained of incessant bullying by the administration, and many have left or are planning their exits at higher rates than the county. APs have been marginalized. Parents and educators complain of being dismissed and gaslit. And the latest panorama data collected from teachers is shockingly negative about the administration at Bellevue Middle. Two formal complaints were filed and dismissed, but there's been no opportunity to share the multitudes of other concerns brought by parents, former parents, and educators, and it's deeply discouraging. Council members Suara, Hurt, Hauser, Mendez, and I 
filed a resolution asking for an independent investigation into the BMS administration because these concerns are going unaddressed and, appears unlikely, and it appears likely that the executive director overseeing this school is protecting the administration. We deferred this resolution so we can lay out concerns with greater specificity but have hesitated because these matters should not have to play out in the public square. The official channels are broken. Teachers and parents recognize this, and there's understandable fear about coming forward when MNPS has appeared to be sweeping it all under the rug. I invite any of you I've not had the opportunity to discuss this wish to reach out to me or another council member since Sunshine Laws limit your ability to discuss directly with Ms. Tyler, who has been fierce about trying to get the attention of administrators to get this problem addressed. Bellevue Middle School is in a downward spiral. And turning a blind eye, blind eye to this pattern of mismanagement and abuse is not an option. Children are being done wrong, families are leaving as a result, and we simply can't afford to lose more teachers. Don't be complicit, I won't. Please help. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Council member Antoinette Lee. Hello, how are you all doing today? Can you understand me okay? Yes. Great. Madam Chair, school board members, and Director Battle, um, thank you for allowing me to speak today. First, I want to thank you for standing up for our children, our teachers, and against other external political establishments that are aimed to divide the cooperation that we have together. When I was asked to come here to speak in support of you, I immediately said, yes. The three past years have been abominable for everyone in education. So yes, I'd like to publicly support you. Do I look like everything you have done and everything you have brought up? No. But you all have done good. Your jobs are hard. You have wonderful employees that have stood steadfast against all of the arrows that have been thrown at them. And they should be concentrated on doing, and they are concentrated on doing what is best for the students of our city, even though they have had lots of barriers before them. You have a talented, knowledgeable director of school who has also stood fast to do her best to enable educators and employees to do their best work. But I will say, as you look up as you look at the architects that are building up your school system, remember who is working directly with the students and who is there making the difference day in and day out. They are, they are where you deserve most of the respect and the accolades. That's where those should go. They are the ones toiling hard to make you look good. And don't forget and don't look over them, please. They are your front line. I also want to ask you, because as the legislature, legislative time is about to come up, I want to ask you to make sure to work. We, there's a time when we have to pull together to work together, because we are foreseeing that there may be some legislation coming up that is not that positive to public schools. So sometimes we have to put what we think apart and pull together for what we can do together to make it better for public public school teachers, public school employees, your support staff, your administration, and you. We are all in this together and we need to listen to each other so that we can find out what needs to be done in order for our educators to do what they need to do to best empire, uh, inspire our students. Thank you for allowing me to come and speak with you. Thank you so much, council member. And we seem to have had a hiccup in our, uh, in our list. We have two that were not listed that signed up together, uh, Ms. B.B. Hines and Dr. Berthina and Bob McKinney. You, it, yes, you, were, you came after uh, Council Member Lee, but our, our system was flawed. Thank you, Chairwoman Bugs, and thank you, Board, for this opportunity to address the school board today. My name is B.B. Hines. I'm the current chair of the MNPS PAC. Uh, please visit our website for all of our information. I'm here to give you an update on what we're, what's coming up. Um, we don't have a meeting this month because we need time to 
rest and recover and get ready for uh, the rest of the um, school year. Um, so in January of next year, we're gonna hold, we plan on holding a uh, packed town hall. We wanna continue the conversation on academics. We don't have a meeting date, time or location yet, um, but the topics are gonna be on advanced academic courses, career and technical education, CTE, gifted and talented programs, and uh, Promise Scholars 2022. So that's the plan for that town hall. Um, in January on the 29th, we'll have the by design movie viewing at the Bellevue Branch uh, Library. So by January, we'd have gone around to all four quarters, and then we'll pick up again on, in February and do another four. Um, the focus for 2022, we're going to work really hard to reach out to more families. Um, MMPS Family Engagement's been working really hard with us. Um, we're also going to shift gears and start working more with MNEA, our teachers. Um, that's our focus for 2022. Um, I'm not gonna speak for the teachers. I'm not a teacher. I don't like speaking for other people, but I do know that they've, they would like parents to support um, their cause, reduce workload and stuff like that. So we're gonna start talking to them about how our parents can help, whether we can volunteer with their organization, um, just be ears that can listen to. We're gonna try to support m &A as much as we can. Um, so it's been a very tough, I don't know, it's three months, four months, I don't know. But it's been very difficult. But one of the lessons that we've learned from all of this is that we really are all in this together. Um, when the parents and the teachers are stressed, our children feel that stress as well. We had a student who came up here and that was pretty sad to witness as, as an adult. I'm, we have to do something. So um, even though Christmas is coming, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, we have a lot of work ahead of us. So our group is gonna continue to reach out to you we're gonna continue asking questions. Um, we do support you, but it's our job as parents to continue to ask questions. And so that's what we'll continue to do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Again, our apologies for the glitch. Dr. Berthina Nabai McKinney and then Carrie Lindley. Hey, good, uh, good evening. Greetings to Dr. Battle, uh, Chair Bugs, and the board members. Um, and all of you in the audience today. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is uh, Dr. Berthina Nabama kinney I serve as the co-secretary and recruiting coordinator for the Parent Advisory Council. I also have the pleasure of serving on the uh, state's eight, one of the state's 18 committees uh, for education funding. Um, my subcommittee specifically focuses on eliciting feedback from parents and families across our state. So I'm gonna pose this question to all of you in the audience that are, pa uh, that are parents and or family members who support students in our, in our education system. How many of you are aware that the state is uh, creating a new funding formula uh, to determine how we fund education in our state? All right. How many of you is this the first time hearing it? Great. So one of the um, things that I am here to do is really focus on eliciting parent voice um, in this conversation and truly making you aware of how we or how the state is looking at funding education. There is currently a form. Uh, uh, there's currently a funding formula in place. I don't know if you've heard of it, it's called the BEP, and what the state is looking to do is to create a new funding formula and really look at how we truly fund um, our schools and how we support children in the way in which they learn across our state. So what I'd like to do is starting in January, we are going to host some public forums as well as um, uh, uh, possibly put out a survey to really elicit your voice so that I can truly represent parents in this conversation and bring that information back to our, our, our subcommittee um, and really elicit those voices that we need to hear. Um, and so I really want all parents to be aware of that. Please go on the State Department of Education, Tennessee Department of Education's website, look at state funding. This is a new initiative by the governor and the commissioner of education. Please look up, 
uh, please look up that information, be familiar with it, and also look for communication over the next month or so uh, regarding this funding formula and how your voice can be uh, uh, seen or, or heard in this conversation. Thank you so much and have a wonderful night. <laughs> Thank you. Next is Carrie Lindley. Carrie Lindley. All right. After that is Lynn Holt. Is it Hoyt? Sorry. We know Lynn. Lynn Hoyt. Thank you for that correction. All right. Next is Jennifer Claxton. Good evening, board members. I'm Jennifer Claxton, District 8. I have two kids at J.T. Moore Middle, and I'm going to give a shout out to Dr. Gary Hughes, the principal there, and the staff who have been tremendous during the pandemic. Please drop the mask mandate when we return. Um, you know, as a parent, me and my children's pediatrician know what's best for my family. In nearly two years, the benefits of masking have not been quantified or proven concretely affected in mitigating beyond self-protection. In fact, most studies have shown that school districts with mask mandates don't fare better with COVID cases than those with, that are mask optional. What has been quantified during this time is that forcing kids to mask seven hours a day have, has contributed to crisis level social, emotional, and physical damage to our kids. We're seeing a lack of social interaction, an abundance of speech delays, and massive learning loss. The reduced oxygen intake from masking in children can cause irreversible damage to the brain, to the lungs, to the heart. It can contribute to anxiety, tiredness, reduced performance, and cognitive function. The warm, moist environment of a child's mask is breeding ground for bacteria, virus, and spores. My kids were sicker with sinus infections than they were with COVID. But most importantly, what value do you place on a smile? There is a positive chemical reaction that happens in your body when someone smiles at you. The feel-good neurotransmitters of serotonin, endorphins, and dopamine are released in the system. And we're robbing kids of that seven hours a day, five days a week. And nowhere else in Nashville is that happening. I think it's, um, to, to think that's not having a crisis level damaging effect on our children is naive or ignorant. The Surgeon General said last week, it would be a great tragedy, tragedy if we beat back one public health crisis, but only allowed another to grow in its place. One in four kids are depressed, one in five are anxious, and there's been a 51% increase in suicide attempts by adolescent girls. I acknowledge that forced masking isn't solely responsible for this, but it's definitely a factor. You were on the wrong side of history keeping our kids out of school for a year. Please don't repeat the same mistakes. Those of us who fought for open schools were right, but we were vilified. Closing schools harmed kids. There's clear crystal data on that. Children at the least risk at COVID for complications, schools across our state, country, and the world are mask optional, and it's been fine. We currently have 92 student cases of COVID. This doesn't warrant a mandate on the 83,000 other students. The courts aren't forcing you to continue the mandate, Dr. Battle. I appreciate that your recommendation is to, to look at the current data and hopefully encourage coming back in the next semester that masks be strongly encouraged rather than mandated. Thank you so much for your time. I understand it's hard to serve during this. I've been there, but please just listen to parents. We would appreciate it. Thank you. James Claxton. Good evening, chair members of the board. My name is Jim Claxton. I work at Granbury Elementary, Creve Hall Elementary, Percy Priest Elementary, Wright Middle School, and John Overton High School. Um, I work with uh, some, some amazing teachers, um, amazing administrators, amazing people in the cafeteria. Um, we all do what we do because we love kids, <coughs> and, uh, and we, don't, we don't deny that you guys don't love your kids too. Um, I, I would just, one thing that I struggle with is the lack <laughs> of connectivity with the internet. And I know that sounds so basic, but it is so infuriating. So much of what I do is cloud-based. Um, just imagine coming into work and you have to wait two hours before you can log on. 
it just it throws your day into a tailspin. I do team meetings probably three three a day, three days a week. Um, it, it's really it's a burden on the staff and it's a burden on kids because all the PLTs are web based. Um, a lot of the assessments are web based. Um, I, I would I would implore you to put some of that the the money that is I, I don't know what COVID did to our <laughs> our infrastructure, but it is we have the one on one is really stressing out the the the, the bandwidth in the buildings. Um, I I, uh, I was in a middle school today, and uh, you know the kids are eating lunch in their room. And in between bites, they had to put their masks on. And, and I work in special ed, and uh, and there was no talking. <laughs> I sat there for 30 minutes. These are five kids, uh, all with basically the same disability, and they were watching a screen of Christmas, like a fireplace, listening to Christmas music, but they couldn't interact. And I was just like, I, I was kind of bummed out by it. I was like, these kids should be talking, they should be laughing. Um, I do appreciate the fact that you mentioned you will think about the mask mandate when we come back. Um, I, I just see, I see so many kids not wearing them appropriately. I probably touch 10 masks a day that are covered in spit just because they, they just developmentally can't handle that. And uh, I, I appreciate all you do. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Claudia Cornelison. Anna Thorson. Good evening, Chair, members of the board. My name is Anna Thorson, and I have two teens at Hillsborough High School. Both of them have um, IEPs, and I want to say thank you for um, the mask mandate in my family. Um, with our disabilities, we're very grateful for it. So what I'm asking for tonight is to talk more about the high school start time. I know you're talking about considering it in um, 2026, but I spoke this week with a parent who was up here in the 1990s asking the board for the same thing. And they did committees and they had surveys and that was 36, so if we postpone this to 2026, we're talking about 36 years. So MMPS has the earliest start time in the country at 7 a.m. Um, experts agree at the CDC, at the American Academy of Pediatrics, and most recently at the Surgeon, Surgeon General that high school should start no earlier than 8.30 a.m. So why teen circadian rhythms move to 11 p.m., which is why teens can't fall asleep. And so if they're supposed to wake up at 5.30 to get on that six o'clock bus, um, they're only getting about six and a half hours of sleep, which causes um, chronic sleep deprivation, which leads to, it's very well studied, poor academic outcomes, 60 cents percent greater tardies, 16% increased accidents, and 70% sports injuries. But what I really care about in my household is mental health. The, um, in a study um, commissioned by school board member Ginny Pupil Walker, um, part of that study reported that for every hour that teens lose of sleep, now remember our teens are usually on average losing about two to three hours of sleep, so for every hour there is a 38% increase in depression and anxiety and there is a 58% increase in attempted suicide. So we're talking again about for every hour of lost sleep, um, the rate of suicide, attempted suicide goes up 58%. And recently, the Surgeon General in December of this year has urged, um, had talked about our mental health crisis and has specifically charged districts to take urgent action on um, school start times because that is shown to really help the mental health crisis that our teens are in. And I know bus, the bus situation is complicated, but um, we also do know that districts our size across the country have been making this change. Seattle, Denver, Atlanta, San Diego. And most recently, amidst this bus crisis, Anne Arundel, uh, Anne Arundel County in, um, in Maryland has done this because they cited the predominant um, imp negative impact on teens. So I urge you all as parents, as teenagers, to email your school board, talk about this with coaches, teachers, and principals. Um, follow startschoollater.net. They have a lot of great information there for parents. Um, because in our house, we a lot of us suffer from mental health around shared family um, trauma. And this is really scary to me. Um, I'm also a bereaved parent already. And the thought of having this mental health crisis out there is really terrifying to me. So I hope you'll take action before 2026. 
thank you for your time. Thank you. Catherine Brown. Tiffany Badgett. Badgett? Badgett. My apologies. Board. My name is Tiffany Badgett, and I'm back here to get on the Knowledge Academy bandwagon again. Um, I'm a mother of three boys, um, raising three boys in the Antioch community. We've experienced both public and private schools over the years. Based off my experience over the years, I allowed my youngest son to make a decision on where he wanted to go. He no longer wanted to attend private school, so we mutually agreed on Knowledge Academy. Shortly after his freshman year, I strongly considered transferring him back to private school. But after long thought, I decided to allow him to stay. And this was a personal testimony to myself. Um, we teach our children to stay the course, so I had to just swallow it and stay that course with him. Over the years, um, we're now in his third year, we have experienced a rebuilt administration a growing mentorship program, volunteer program that has raised over thousands of dollars for the athletic program. We've experienced local college tours, visited um, visitors by local college athletes, um, teacher student accountability. Um, the athletes have to report grades daily. Um, they've even learned about stock. So my son comes home teaching me about stock. I could definitely go on and on. But I really wanted to encourage the M MNPS to pour into the Antioch com community by supporting Knowledge Academy. If I could do it all over again, I would have put all my children in a Knowledge Academy if it was a Knowledge Academy when my oldest son was in school. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Tanya Drosner. Good evening, Dr. Battle, Chair, and members of the board. My name is Dr. Tanya Drostner, and I am a third grade teacher at Glenview Elementary. This is my 12th year as an educator and my fifth year with Metro Nashville Public Schools. While working in an urban school can be challenging, I feel a great sense of purpose and responsibility to my students when I come to work each day. I'm here speaking to you tonight on behalf of both educators and students. Mother Teresa said I alone cannot change the world but I can cast a stone across the water to create many ripples. I feel our school district is poised with great leadership and could serve as an exemplar model to other urban school districts across our nation. We could be the change makers, the one to cast the stones that cause the much needed ripple effects. On behalf of all educators, I want to thank you for making this Friday an optional work remotely day. I believe you took an important step towards prioritizing the mental health of educators and it is much appreciated. I implore you to consider extending our winter break or making more days optional work remotely days during the second semester. I assure you it would be greatly appreciated. There is much work to be done in the second semester, but teachers are feeling the strain of so many different things at this time. I know you are aware of the vacancies and sub shortages we are experiencing, and we want to know more about what is being done to address these issues. Teachers are tired of not having a much needed break during the day, and more often than not, more than two days of planning time are taken up per week due to various meetings or other action items. These are not necessarily violations of the MOU, but important meetings that must happen for the sake of our students and families. <coughs> Teachers do not want to miss out on collaborative planning with our teams. We shouldn't have to choose. Teachers care and want to do everything possible to help, but we need our planning time to effectively implement our new reading curriculum. Discussing lessons with our teams for around an hour each week is nowhere near the amount of time it takes to effectively plan for these lessons or what we need to be prepared <clears throat> for our students. One of our core tenets in MNPS is to create and support engaging rigorous and personalized learning experiences for all students, but we are not afforded the time to do so. When we reach out about needs for our students, we are met with their caseload is full. When our parents are telling us they need help and we go through the collaborative referral process, it is taking too long and we are not feeling the relief or support that we need to be feeling and receiving in these areas. I believe your initiatives are rooted in wanting nothing but the best for our district. However, Maya Angelou said, you can only truly become accomplished at something you love. 
While I love my job, it is difficult to feel accomplished and love all 14 initiatives. There are too many. Peter Green recently penned a letter of encouragement to teachers who may be feeling as if they are at the end of their rope. He said it best when he said, while you feel as if you're shoveling jello with a pitchfork, your efforts are not wasted. I do believe our efforts are not wasted, but a lot of things are heavily weighing on us at this time. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Paula Pendergrass. Greetings, Madam Chair, school board members, and Dr. Battle. I am Dr. Paula Pendergrass, the current Vice President of MNEA. This evening, I came prepared to address a, a memo dated November 19, 2021, that was sent to all the chiefs, executive directors, and principals. The memo stated that Governor Lee signed sweeping COVID-19 legislation on November the 12th, and one aspect of the legislature directly impacts our ability to offer COVID-19 sick leave. It explains that Tennessee Code Annotated 14.2.102 prohibits a school from taking an adverse action against a person based on their vaccination status. Therefore, because of this change in state law, COVID-19 sick leave is not available after November the 12th. In particular, I wanted to address the last sentence of that memo, which states that there are no changes to the previous guidance about working remotely if an employee is following CDC guidance and needs to quarantine. I have since been in contact with members of the HR team and ensure that they would be looking at ways to remove the red tape, such as the lack of substitute teachers and rigid de definitions of remote working to prevent educators from utilizing the action described in the last paragraph of the November 19th memo. We recognize that teachers are having to quarantine due to positive COVID testing, although many have already been vaccinated and even have their booster shots. I look forward to working with the HR team to making sure that we are not creating structural barriers that are working against MNPS teachers who are increasingly finding themselves scared, anxious, angry, or just plain overwhelmed by it all. I thank you, Madam Chair, school board members, Dr. Battle, for giving me the opportunity to speak before you. And I also want to thank Melissa, Lisa, Dr. Bellamy, and Hera Finch, who is not present today, but helping me navigate a very difficult situation on behalf of a member. Thank you. Thank you. Beverly Whalen Schmeller. Good evening. I'm Dr. Beverly Whalen well, Whalen Schmeller, school psychologist and itinerant. I want you to know what it's like working in the schools this year. In a word, it's heavy. Working in the spring of 2020 was like wearing concrete boots, carrying cinder blocks, and then being asked to scale a brick wall. Thanks to vaccines, we are not scaling that brick wall, but we are still carrying that weight. If we do not lighten the load, we will fall. First, we'll celebrate. Working from home this Friday, we are exhausted. Thank you, Dr. Battle, for recognizing that. The district has helped us get vaccines and online therapy, and a teacher just told me today how helpful the therapy has been to her. School psychology has contract workers to help us with some of the cases, and it's helped so much. And we have several lead psychologists to guide us. Thank you for funding their positions. But I'm here to tell you that we are still wearing those concrete shoes and carrying cinder blocks, even if they're decorated for the holidays. We are still in the pandemic. There is toxic stress at every level. So what do we need? We need dedicated space to do our work in the buildings. We need you to eliminate some of these required meetings because school psychologists have stuff to do. We have testing, we have counseling, we have consulting. There's more need than ever. Kids need group therapy and we're doing threat assessments. Most of the kids are okay, but the ones who are not okay are really not okay. We need to hire more school psychologists. The recommended ratio is one school psych for 500 students. In Metro, it's closer to one to 1,200 students. The district needs to fund this one school psych per school. Working extra hours isn't gonna fix this, it's gonna lead to more burnout. Let us work from home occasionally when we're just doing paperwork. We proved last year that we could do it. Innovate, 
Most of the kids have some missing skills. Let's meet them where they are and be creative. Metro will always get criticized, so let's go ahead and find creative solutions. We need to hire those paraprofessionals and the substitutes. This is a safety issue in our schools. Itinerants are in every single school. Why not ask us about the innovation and success that we're seeing? We're happy to share that info. Thank you for listening, and please help us carry that weight, and we'll help you as well. Thanks. Thank you. Sarah Morrison. Good evening. My name is Sarah Morrison, and I'm a third grade teacher at Schwab Elementary and a member of MNEA. Adam Grant, a professor and author who specializes in psychology, shared a tweet last week that said, the holidays shouldn't be a time to recharge. They should be a time to celebrate. If work is exhausting people to the point that they're using their time off to recover, you might have a burnout culture. A healthy organization doesn't leave people drained in the first place. MMPS teachers are not just tired. We are completely burnt out. A bar has been set for elementary teachers two years into this pandemic that is unattainable and demoralizing. And we're reminded of these expectations almost daily when it comes to our new ELA curriculum. I understand the legal requirement for a curriculum for the district and the need for structured and consistent instruction that is delivered from one classroom to another. During my time in MMPS, I've served on a curriculum adoption committee, as well as scope and sequence writing committees for two other departments. The Wit and Wisdom curriculum as a whole has some very valuable components and has allowed many of our students to show tremendous growth in their writing so far this year. But the expectation with the extremely rigorous pacing of the Wit and Wisdom's lessons is impractical and unrealistic for the population that we serve in MMPS. We do use what the district gives us for instructional materials for these lessons, but it's not enough. Adding in the, the specific supports that our students need in order to absorb, the, absorb this content takes so much time. And when we ask for that time, we don't get it. Instead, we are reminded of what we need to do to stay on track, and we're told to push through one lesson into the next. We've had visitors from the support hub come into our classrooms to model these lessons, and surprisingly, they're also unable to meet their own expectations for pacing in a way that actually provides engagement and learning for every student. Needless to say, that doesn't make teachers feel very supported. Instead, it makes us feel discouraged and sometimes even a little bit crazy. There's a concept in the educator world called the door principle, which is the idea that teachers really enjoy the things that happen on the classroom side of their doors. That's the good stuff. The building relationships with kids, helping them understand new ideas, meeting their individual needs, and watching them learn and grow. What happens on the other side of the door is what drives burnout. It's not the kids. I absolutely love my school, my students, their families, and I'm so, so lucky because my building administrators are amazing. But as a two-time teacher of the year, um, a mentor to a Belmont resident teacher and someone who's right in the middle of completing my national board certification, I don't know if I want to continue to pursue that because I'm spending a lot of time this year pondering if I wanna stay in the classroom. I'm pondering if I wanna stay in education in general. We don't need any more initiatives from the district. We don't need any more walkthroughs or evaluations. We don't need any more planning pr protocols or tools. We need time and trust to do our jobs. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah Morrison, um, sorry, Kellyanne Graff. Hi, my name is Kellyanne Graff. I live in 37210 and I work at Thurgood Marshall Middle School. Um, I came here today not to ask for a pay increase, but an increase in support. So as you've heard over and over again, we are not just tired, but we are demoralized but we are happy to find actionable and expedient solutions with you. In 2021, it was not uncommon to see teachers leading two or three classes simultaneously in the gym or in the cafeteria using like a Britney Spears style microphone so that all students could hear them. Well, yes, these teachers are being paid extra for their extra work, this is not a situation we should be encountering in a fully, in a quote, fully funded district. Um, 
increasing pay for substitute teachers, supporting administration and recruiting substitutes, and allowing administrators and um, non-teaching staff to, repay, um, to receive in lieu of subpay will decrease this workload on classroom teachers and increase quality of instructional time. Um, we're not allowed to, um, to deny split students. We're not allowed to deny covering extra classes unless it's during, specifically during our lunch or our planning. And even those have been taken from some people. Our MOU isn't being followed with, um, in regards to planning time. There's always an emergency meeting, a 504, a safety team, a IEP review, ILP advice. There's always something added on. Um, teachers across the district are feeling suffocated and micromanaged by the amount of meetings, initiatives, and less, um, less in documentation expectations. Teachers are professionals. Give us the autonomy and opportunity to show our mastery. Constantly adding in new curriculums and having us shift. This is my third year working for the district and I've taught Learn Zillion, Florida Virtual School, and now my perspectives. Every single year I've been like, okay, I'm gonna create these materials and I'm gonna get to use them again and again in my career and every single year it switches again. And I don't have other experienced teachers that can lend me because it's new to all of us constantly. Um, as a district, we say we prioritize SEL, but we are given um, our first grade teachers teaching wit and wisdom. They're not given time to get to know their students, to accommodate for often majority EL classrooms. We have students being added to our um, sheltered EL class almost weekly. There was a point where we were at 33 students in our sheltered EL classroom those students aren't receiving the services that they need. We need more EL teachers. We need more EE support. Um, and once again, I'm not asking for more pay. I'm asking for more support. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> MNEA President Michelle Sheriff. That was part of my intro, so I'll skip that part. Um, good evening, Chair, members of the board, Dr. Battle. I come to, um, before you tonight to speak on several important issues regarding our Nashville educators. First, I wanna thank you for the district's past participation in collaborative conferencing. Nashville educators are thankful that the board ratified one of the most comprehensive MOUs in the state of Tennessee. Other districts actually are using ours as a model. As you know, Tennessee law recognizes that a collaborative relationship between the board and its professional employees will assist in the establishment and maintenance of an educational climate and working environment that will attract and retain a high, highly qualified professional staff. Your ratification of our prior MOU affirms to educators in Nashville that you value our work and our opinions. We appreciate the opportunity to collaborate on matters that are essential to attracting and retaining a highly qualified professional staff so that together we can achieve the highest possible educational standards in our school district. Tonight I come before you to again express concerns about the lack of time educators have to plan, prepare lessons, analyze student work, prepare individualized lessons for students, and do the things that you typically think of educators doing day to day. Um, yesterday evening, m &E held a town hall with Dr. Battle and MMPS chiefs. We appreciate the district's participation as it's important for educators to hear directly from Dr. Battle and MMPS leadership. MNEA members submitted questions for the town hall and the majority of the questions submitted concerned the high number of vacancies and teacher morale. The two issues go hand in hand. The lack of substitute teachers causes increased workloads and demands for our educators. Unfilled vacancies are one of the main issues causing teachers um, to lack the planning time to complete the tasks necessary for instruction during their contracted workday. Teachers have extra students in their classes daily and are asked to substitute during planning times. Many educators are staying for up to an hour after school to supervise students due to the bus driver shortage. These vacancies take time and focus away from the preparation and execution of highly qualified lessons, thus negatively affecting student outcomes. 
the ongoing expectations and normalization that educators will complete assigned tests after contracted hours for free is bad for morale. All of this is detrimental to student outcomes. We know there's a need for a short-term sol short solution to fill vacancies and that we must find creative solutions together to improve the day-to-day -day lives of our educators and students. Our collaboration must continue and MEA stands ready to partner with the district to find a solution to this ongoing and pressing problem. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Haley Trauger. Good evening. My name is Haley Trauger and I am an engineering and bio STEM teach CTE teacher at Antioch High School and an Antioch resident. I am here tonight because our students deserve schools and transportation that are safe and allow them to focus on their learning. I imagine at this point, you may be tired of us teachers coming month after month to speak about bus and substitute teachers. But I assure you that our students are more tired of being packed three high schoolers to a seat during a pandemic, or forced to race out at the closing bell for the chance at a slightly safer window seat on a bus, or of waiting for hours for bus drivers to return for their second job. When I challenged my engineering students to tackle any one pressing issue in our school community with innovative design solutions, the number one issue that my period 1B focused on was mitigating COVID on crowded buses. I'm incredibly proud of the effort my students put in and the creative ideas that they pitched. But decent and safe transportation should be a basic right for all our students, not something that students feel they need to figure out on their, for themselves. Likewise, a teacher for each class section and adequate substitute coverage should be basic rights for our students' education. We need you to ur urgently take more action to address bus drivers, support staff, teacher, and substitute shortages. We also need you to understand that efforts to address, to reduce teacher workload and burnout are a critical part of addressing teacher shortages. We come to work every day because we love our students and we believe they deserve our very, very best. Our students need our time, attention, and care, not additional tech platforms like sewn to grow that attempt to standardize and monitor student-teacher relationships without meaningful benefits for student mental health. Steps like reducing extra paperwork and initiatives or canceling evaluations as the pandemic continues can reduce teacher stress, freeing us to focus on our students as individuals and encouraging teachers to stay in MPS. Finally, I want to reiterate that the pandemic continues. Those of us in schools know that those low case counts reflect serious undercounts. From where I sit in the front lines um, and as Omicron surges, this is not the right time to consider lifting our mask mandate. We need continued and renewed mask mandates, contact tracing, and the other basic safety measures to keep ourselves and our students safe. I urge you to prioritize students' health and safety by returning, retaining our mask mandate and other COVID mitigation measures. And I urge you to take steps equally critical for student safety to ensure adequate staffing and reduce crowding on our buses and in our classrooms. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Lauren Herring. Good evening, Dr. Battle and the board. Uh, my name is Lauren Herring. I have two children in MNPS. I live in Ms. Elrod's district. Uh, I am also a regular MNPS substitute, mostly in the elementary schools. I apologize if my stomach growls. I hope you all have snacks up there because I'm dying. Um, I'm happy to hear that the mask mandate will be discussed math next month. As you consider, please take a moment to realize when the current universal mask mandate either does not apply or does, is not enforced. For example, lunchtime. Cafeterias are packed with kids all over each other, crammed on, crammed on the benches around those tiny little tables. Athletics. MNPS athletes are not expected to wear masks as they practice or play in matches or even while they sit the bench together on the sidelines. Third, performing arts. Due to the policy quietly enacted on November 17th, students are now able to unmask in theater, dance, choral, and instrumental music performances. And finally, teachers and coaches who do not, cannot, or refuse to mask, whatever their reasons, there are certainly adults in the school buildings who are unmasked or improperly masked. If you've spent more than 10 minutes in a school building or have attended an after-school event, you would know that there's a significant amount of time that students and sometimes adults are together unmasked. Each one of these events involves close contact of more than 15 minutes. They occur frequently, even daily, in the uh, occasion of lunch, Aside from the performing arts policy, they've been occurring since school returned in person for everyone last March. 
And since last March, they have not been linked to increased cases, hospitalizations, or death in our schools or the community. Your own data show that kids are safe in schools despite all of these times that they are in masks. The time to re-examine the universal mask mandate is here. I would like to go on public record to ask for the board and Dr. Battle's plan for removing the mandate. What metrics are being used to justify its necessity? Where is the data that you are analyzing to keep the mandate in place? This should be public information. Last year, you kept school buildings closed while all surrounding districts returned to in-person school. This year, you hold on to your mask mandate while all other surrounding districts have canceled theirs. There is no statistical difference in case rates from our district and any of the surrounding districts. Just like last year, you're putting COVID ahead of the whole child instead of the whole child ahead of COVID. And just like last year, you refuse to communicate a plan to remove unnecessary restrictions. A teacher I spoke with this week said that the mask mandate is putting our students at a quote, pedagogical disadvantage to all other students in Middle Tennessee and beyond. I don't think this is the legacy you want to leave. Please reconsider. Thank you. <clears throat> Emma Ohm. Uh, Jacqueline Smith. Good evening. I thought I'd get in place. I'm going to take us back to KA. Uh, my name is Jackie Smith, and I serve as the Community Engagement Director for Knowledge Academy under the Noble Education Initiative umbrella. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you this evening about the work it took to build a wonderful bank of community partners after a very difficult process of surviving the targeted closing of the school. Several partners no longer wanted to engage KA because of the extremely negative publicity that was thrown at the school. It gave us the chance, though, to work hard to show the community what we wanted to do to make a great educational experience for students and for families. We are grateful for partners like the Nashville Pl Black Police Association, who kept us supplied with food boxes as we pressed through the pandemic. We are grateful for Total Health and Dental, Dental Clinic, sponsored by Meharry Medical, who provided COVID screenings and vaccines for our families. We are grateful for the South District Metro Nashville Police Department, who comes to mentor our kids and sometimes play a little basketball with them. We are grateful for the Crossings Nashville Association Partnership for being a constant support to our school. And we must mention the great Victor Chapman, who donated a baby grand piano to our school and drops in to offer his support. Pastor Cornelius Hill was here earlier, and he had to leave. But he's been with KA from the beginning, and he was an inspirational commencement speaker at our 2019 graduation. And we would be remiss if we didn't mention Bethel World Outreach Church, who has contributed hundreds of book bags and school supplies to our students and gift bags to our teachers. And the tutoring that goes on at KA is also a gift from Bethel World Outreach Church. We, we couldn't do it without them. In addition to being an outstanding partner to Knowledge Academy, Joy Stiles, our councilwoman, called us just the other day with an offer of uh, Nutcracker Ballet tickets for our kids. And for that, we are also grateful. My final mention would be the Southeast Public Library, who is now partnering with, with us to head up our robotics after school program. I mention these to say we have a number of great uh, people and community entities who are contributing to the success and stability of KA, and they are committed to the long-term health and well-being of Knowledge Academies. Our partners have chosen, chosen to support KA, and we appreciate them, appreciate them, and we would appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you. Catherine Herring. Good evening, board. Um, I'm Catherine Herring. I'm in District 5. Um, my address is on record if you need it. I am a family nurse practitioner, and I wanted to go ahead and talk about, of course, the mask mandate again, and to share a little bit of why I'm so passionate about reconsidering the mask mandate. Um, 
My dad is severely bipolar with psychotic features. He has suicidal and uh, homicidal ideations. This has been going on since I was a teenager. Um, <laughs> I hate to, um, since we're all so tired, I'll share one daddy's story, but when uh, when I was 20 years old, he decided that he was moving to Tennessee, I'm sorry, and uh, um, he bought 47 cemetery plots, packed up my grandfather's entire gun collection, and um, eventually was arrested. One of those cemetery plots was for me. Um, so when I say I'm concerned about the mental health of our children, I am very concerned because what doctors have told us about my dad is it's related to early childhood trauma. And last week, the Surgeon General issued an advisory for the youth mental health crisis. As a reminder, suicide is the number two leading cause of death for children, for school age children. The Surgeon General mentioned that symptoms of anxiety and depression in children have doubled. ER visits for teenage girl suicide attempts are up 51% compared to 2019. A study from Brown University revealed the social distancing measures, including face masks, are suspected of causing young children's development to drop by up to 23%. And we all know of the learning loss that Metro Nashville school students have experienced this year. Adverse childhood experiences can lead to toxic stress development that can cause disrupted brain development and increase the, list, the risk for lifelong mental health conditions and other health problems that my father has experienced his entire life. Per federal EUA law 564, parents and doctors must be aware of the stats and monitor their children for adverse reactions from long-term daily masking, including depression, anxiety, learning, learning loss, and suicidal ideation. If they are experiencing these things, they must have the option to refuse the mask per EUA law 564. Mask, cloth masks are not FDA approved products. They're under EUA, just like the vaccines are emergency youth auth authorized, and we must have the option to refuse especially if children are experiencing adverse reactions to them. So I noticed that my five-year-old was having adverse reactions. I know my family history. And so I talked to our doctor and I got a medical mask exemption for her. When I told the school, when I told the school about this, they told me that her accommodation was that she's not allowed to sit in the group desk anymore. She is isolated into the corner by herself. She is forced to the back of the school line every day and she has to eat lunch by herself every day. This is your ADA and 504 accommodation for my child who is already at high risk for mental health issues. I ask that you please reconsider your mental, your medical, your ma medical mask exemptions. Thank you. Thank you. Edwin Lee. Good evening. Uh, I represent Knowledge Academies and I live in Madison, Tennessee. Uh, I'll tell you a little story. I had a fifth grader. I teach theater arts at Knowledge Academy. I teach high school in a eighth grade class. I had a, I had a uh, fifth grader come up to me. He said, Mr. Lee, he decided he's going to wear a tie today. He said, Mr. Lee, uh, help me tie my tie. Now, this, notice this tie was on a clip-on, and the tie had come apart. Now, granted, I hadn't used a clip-on tie since I was about his age. So I tried, and I said, hey, I did the best, best I could. I said, hey, but you look nice. I like the shoes you got on. He came back to me maybe a couple of days later with a real tie. And he said, Mr. Lee, can you help me tie my tie? So I tied it up for him, put it around his neck, tightened it up for him. I said, man, you look sharp, man. I like what you got on. You look sharp. I said that to say that we add value to our students. We add value. Our administration, our staff, our, uh, all that's involved add value to our students. And we add value to our students by three ways. First, we love. We love the opportunity to change and to impact lives. We love the opportunity to be able to help, to encourage. As you heard, uh, Isaac came up and he was so uh, uh, passionately how he felt about how he feels about being at Knowledge Academy. Another way that we impact students is through acceptance. We accept students for who they are and where they are because we know and believe that we can help them to get where they need to be. And lastly, accountability. We hold our students accountable because without it, they cannot grow and be all that God has created them to be. So 
we understand, as I've heard the testimonies that come forth, that what we do, the struggle is real. But at Nodge Academy, failure is not an option. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Anna Barnes. Good afternoon. My name is Anna Barnes, and I'm one of very many unfortunate MNPS parents. I would like to address all of you today and ask to focus your energy and your resources on educating our children. There is a clear learning loss among Metro students, and this is what this board and this administration need to focus on. This is the promise that you made to us, parents, when you took this job, to educate our children. Please do not get caught up in the weird power struggle trying to attach yourselves to a lawsuit that has nothing to do with Davidson County. This is just as absurd as me suggesting that Dr. Battle is person of interest in Gabby Petito's murder. With this being said, I would like to respectfully address the board and administration and to ask to follow the state law and stop the mask mandate for Davidson students. Additionally, you probably know, Governor Lee has recently removed the state of emergency for the state of Tennessee. To quote one of the best coaches in history, Bill Belichick, do your job. Thank you. Thank you. Eric Lewis. Good evening uh, to the chair, the board, honored scholars. My name is Eric Lewis. I'm the executive director of Knowledge Academies, and I'm grateful and honored to uh, be representing our board uh, and our staff, our students, and our parents tonight. Uh, grateful to our volunteer board members, especially to our long-serving board chair, uh, Mr. James Bristol. Mr. Bristol and our uh, wonderfully engaged board members represent uh, several university administrators, a prominent partner in a law, local law firm, business owners representing industries of business consulting, accounting, marketing, public relations, and I stand to represent this giving group of leaders today. With the board, I work hand-in-hand -hand with our not-for-profit and locally present management team of Noble Education Initiative, and my duties include operations, finance, and the like. A few of the accomplishments uh, operationally and financially I'd like to uh, share uh, with you of what we are proud of. Our most recent accomplishments include our starting teacher pay uh, beginning at $50,000 this year plus bonus incentives. There could not be a better time for such a move for our teachers uh, who deserve so much. The school has added critical roles of operational and cultural needs emerging from the past two years of global and local struggle. This includes our director of student services, our family engagement representative, our licensed school counselor and our college career readiness coach that is literally coaching up students to pursue their post-secondary goals beginning in their middle grades as well. Our CMO, Noble Education Initiative, supports the school in unprecedented ways with, with roles uh, that are local, such as our Director of Operations Compliance, our Director of Community Engagement, and Director of community, uh, Curriculum Instruction that are all on-site and uh, local for support and leadership. In addition to our operational stability, our board and CMO are committed to KA's financial health as well. KA cur uh, currently carries a cumulative fund balance of a million dollars and is projected to operate with surplus this year for the 2021 uh, school year for all the, uh, the KA schools uh, combined. Since NEI has become the CMO in 2019, the school's financial performance has substantially stabilized and has been professionalized. The school's balanced budgets uh, consecutively increased the fund balances. The school has excellent working relationship with our lender partners and continues to operate with mutually agreed upon pathway forward to keep the school on stable financial footing, to resume our debt service payments and advance the school for the future. The school hired professional grants management team members in the spring of 2021 and is timely in the current drawdowns and compliant with all the requirements. K uh, enrollment uh, declined precipitously in 2019 after the, the board uh, publicly attempted to close our schools. While the school was successful in preventing the closure through the appeal to the state board, it impaired the school's ability to maintain its enrollment. 
Uh, and, yet, and yet for the school year 2021, the school's enrollment has increased year over year and is building positive momentum in our community, uh, even after uh, the COVID closures and our struggles. Our school, Knowledge Academy Middle School, was designed and approved as a small, innovative learning community to serve families choosing to pursue college, community, creativity, and culture in their learning environment. Thank you for, and I hope that you uh, respectfully will vote to renew our charter uh, renewal for Knowledge Academies again this year. Thank, Thank you. you. Dr. Kim Germany. Good evening, board chair, board members, Dr. Battle. My name is Dr. Kim Germany, and I serve as the Director of School Operations and Compliance for Noble Education Initiative, a position that I have had since July. I wanted to come tonight to talk about some of the academic gains that Knowledge Academy has experienced, mostly due to the success block at the school, because of the high quality professional development for teachers and staff, as well as for results oriented instruction. KA Middle School exited CSI status based upon significant improvements in growth and student proficiency rates. KA is no longer in the 5% bottom of schools in the state. KA is now a TVOS 3 for the academic school year of 2021. In fact, according to the state assessment data for spring 2021, KA Middle School has higher percentages of students on track or mastery in ELA, math, and social studies than any of the surrounding middle schools, including Antioch Middle, Apollo, JFK, Margaret Allen, and Thurgood Marshall. KA Middle School exceeded the TCAP participation rate requirement for 2021 with 94%. In fact, our current benchmark data assessment shows we are on track for growth in our students, especially for ELA. We're so very proud. In fact, last May, 100% of our seniors graduated. I am just amazed by KA's growth, the growth of Nashville, as well as the growth of the Antioch community. This is not the Nashville that I left in 2009. The current Antioch is not the same Antioch from my old teaching days at Antioch High School in room H200. In the past, most of the congestion in Antioch was on Murfreesboro Row, Bell Row, and arrival and dismissal of schools, but not anymore. With the rapidly growing community, brings rapidly growing and larger student bodies. But KA is positioned for growth. KA is a gem. It is a safe haven for not only academic growth, but also personal development and high quality individualized instruction. Our primary goal is to make sure students are college and or career ready. KA delivers with a personal touch. Every kid is known. Every kid is loved. Every kid has an adult with high expectations for themselves as well as for teaching and learning. Please don't take that away from our students, from our community, from our families. As a career educator and a former parent of a Thank Metro you. National Magnet School student, I encourage Thank you, you to vote for the Carl renewal of Kirk. KA. Thank you. Carl Kirk. Uh, Mohammed Jabassini, Habassini. Hello, I promise you I'm the last one from Knowledge Academy to speak tonight. <laughs> That's uh, all right. Man. Uh, my name is Mahmoud Jabassini. Um, they call me MJ. One of the students mentioned my name earlier. Um, after 19 years of working for refugee services in Nashville, and three tours in Iraq as a cultural advisor with the Army. I landed this job at Knowledge Academies 11 years ago. I was there when they first opened the doors for the first 150 students, fifth and sixth grade. Since then, I watched those kids grow with us. A lot of them graduated in the last three years. Um, 
Some of the kids they spoke earlier, before I forget, number 15, Hanok, his sister graduated last year and she's on a full scholarship to Vanderbilt to study neuroscience. And number 21 on the list, James, his sister, she is on a full scholarship. She went to Lipscomb to study nursing. Um, I've been there since day one. I've seen the school grow. Uh, we established a great relation with the families. It's not just about the kids. It's we involve the families all the time. Um, it's a great environment. I really, I mean, uh, need your support. We don't have to be scared of you about closing the school. We need to feel like you are on our side to help us support and keep the school open. I'm press my case. Thank you. You have a good evening. You do the same. Thank you. That concludes our public part participation portion of our meeting. And uh, to be quite honest, we've been here since about 2.15. So we're going to take a quick five-minute break yeah. for biology needs. Stand and stretch. Go grab a Snickers if you need to. So we will be back at 7... <clears throat> oh, my gosh. 7.55. <laughs> Steadfast with us. We have but a couple more items on our uh, agenda for the evening. We will move on to governance issues, beginning with the consent agenda. Do we have a motion or an amendment to the consent agenda as listed? I'm so sorry. I need to pull some things from okay. the consent agenda, please. Um, I want to pull items A, 8, 11, 12, 20, and 22. I'm sorry, say that one more time. You said 8? 8, 11, 12, 20, and 22. But um, we can discuss them as a group because my um, concerns and questions about them are, are related to the, it, they're all from the same RFP. Okay, so we have eight, that's IN2 Electric LLC, 11 Lee Company, Lee Company, 12 Liberty Electrical Contracting Company, Inc., uh, the irony, um, 20 Southeast Electric Inc. and 22 Thompson Electric as, and these will all be discussed as a unit as they are all from the same RFP. All right. So we have an amendment to, it, to the agenda. Do I have a motion to accept the amended agenda, amended consent agenda? So moved. I have a, a motion from Mrs. Player Peters. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All right. All in favor for the, to pass the amended consent agenda, please raise your hand. All right, all opposed? Aye. Oh, <laughs> oh I, um, Mr. Little, uh, thank you for chiming in. We are going to put you on the screen as we have to see your face for you to be able to vote. But thank you for reminding us you're here. Are you in a tunnel? Do you need help? That was a little whiz like. All right, um, so it has been, the, the amended consent agenda has been approved. We will move on to discuss Again, um, items A8, 11, 12, 20, 22. Mrs. Masters. Thank you. I just, so in, in the interest of, of just providing full transparency around our processes with contracting, and I did send some, some warning that I was planning to pull these. These are all from RFP 159211. Um, it looks like they are all around providing electrical services. Um, each one individually is not to exceed five million dollars and it's to um, provide qualified contractors to provide quotes on electrical service projects so totaling 25 million dollars potentially and I just my questions my question was around um, sort of just the process of putting out an RFP that resulted in choosing five separate um, vendors, are we actually planning to contract for 25 million in electrical projects, or is this one of these things where it's not going to reach that threshold? Is there a potential that we won't use all of these different vendors? Um, were these vendors ranked, or did we go into the process knowing we wanted to choose five different ones. I kind of just, since it's $25 million, wanted to just have a little mo more information around that whole process. 
Thank you. We'll if there's anyone left, you can. Procurement team, join us at the podium. Thank you. Well, good evening. Uh, my name is Stephen Pittman. I'll be speaking on behalf of procurement. This was done, um, the RFP, was done to create a pool of qualified contractors so that whenever the facilities and maintenance department has a project that meets this scope, they can then reach out to the pre-qualified contractors and receive quotes at that time. So with um, how busy the contractors are with this type of service in Nashville right now, and with the expected work that we have coming up uh, in, from the facilities department, we just wanted to have these contractors in place so that they can meet what we need on a timely basis and then also get constant, you know, good pricing because we're constantly competing each job. In regards to the $5 million per contract, that is the cap. There is no minimum guarantee. We just have it set there so if one or two vendors happen to constantly be the low cost, we have the availability to use them. There is no guarantee to spend $5 million per contract. So it, are you saying that the, the estimated actual cost um, of the work or the potential work is more like $5 million, not $25 million? I don't know the exact. David, David Provitt could probably speak to the estimates, but I know that when it came to us, it's probably in the 10 to $15 million range so that we have the availability to use what we need when we need, but it's, it was not, I, we don't have the, there's no guarantee, minimum. How many um, bids did we get on this RFP? We received five, and after evaluation, all five came back and scored very well and were viewed as qualified contractors. Okay. Is it typical for us to choose that many? It depends on the type of work, and when it comes to this type of service, we've seen you know, three to five contractors chosen for this type before. Okay. And I'm assuming that all of them will be subject to um, some of the, the qualifications that we, we've discussed in meetings over the course of the past year and a half about qualified contractors and subcontracting and all the sorts of standards that we're wanting to put on the workers that we hire? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Tyler? I just to ask one question. Um, I understand the process of it. Um, I just wanted to ask a little bit about the scores. We, I had talked briefly about when we are vetting these companies before they bid on our projects to not just use a scoring system that dings negative things, but also ones that give them the opportunity to have positive responses. So. Um, companies that have zero safety inci incidents in their company would get a higher score than a company that had had um, safety problems within some of their work. Or um, where we're looking at making sure that our the workers have always been fairly compensated within the all their far time that would give them like with not just with us but in general with their history with the, the city and, and anybody else that they work with so i know that we were scoring them on a bunch of different things and we had talked about adding some more criteria to that score to see if we could kind of incentivize some of the people that we work with to you know up safety standards and to things like that so i was just wondering if that was if that happened or not. I don't have the full evaluation criteria on this one with me, but I do know that when we put the EVA criteria together, we score it based on the response. So we'll ask a question like, a question like how would you mitigate risk? And a, a, a good response will receive more points opposed to a, not, a, a response we don't you know, view as strong or detailed. So we do put that into account when we do the evaluations. Okay, all right. That was it. I just wanted to see if we had, you know, we, I know we changed all of our contract language moving forward. So yeah. I know that that is not an issue. I was just wondering about vetting the companies. So thank you. Any other questions from the board? Uh, the only thing I want to note is that it's interesting contract 11 is Lee company, but I'll save my sarcasm and frustration for he who shall remain, remain nameless. So do we have a motion <laughs> for these five contracts? Motion to approve. Do we have a second? Second. All right, no further discussion. All, uh, all in favor, please raise your hand. All right, it passes unanimously. Mr. Little? Yep. 
We have to see his face. I'm sorry. But if you don't mind, we I'm just not... need to see your face for the vote. Um, just, just, just to be sure. It, it's okay. I mean, we, you, it's passed. So, okay. We'll take it. That's fine. All right. Um, we see you now. It, uh, just making sure that's a yes vote. Yes. All right. Thank you. We will now move on to, oh, um, to number two, Knowledge Academy. And we've had a request from board member Bush. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I wanted to um, make a motion to defer this particular item for KA. First and foremost, I want to thank all the students and administration staff that came to speak before us tonight. Um, I just, uh, at this point, um, feel from listening to other board members that we need additional information so that we can make a better, um, I guess, uh, kind of take more of a deep dive into the information that's needed in order to make a, a decision um, based on the application and also the consolidation. So based on that, I want to make a motion to um, defer um, uh, Knowledge Academy's um, application and, um, um, what's that merger call? Application and, anyway. it was just doing the application, not the, but I know you all want the information on the consolidation, right? But that's not on, that won't Okay, so the application until the next board meeting, which will be in January. Okay, would you mind just restating your sure. motion? I would like to make a motion to defer Knowledge Academy's application until the next board meeting that will be in January. All right, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Discussion? All right. Go right ahead, Mrs. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Masters. I was just going to say I appreciated all the speakers this evening. But I did note that they were all from the high school, whereas this renewal application is for the middle school. So just. Thank you, Mrs. Masters. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion before we vote? All right. Well, I think it might be important for people to know that we're deferring it based on a different plan of action that they have come to us with at the very last second. So this is not kicking the can down the road because we're not sure. This is, we have been presented with a, a, another deal that, that Knowledge Academy is wanting to, to discuss, and we need to get more information about it before we can decide on this. So we're, this is not a kick the can down the road. We're not wanting to make a decision. This is a, we're trying to do our due diligence. And for the viewing public's um, perusal, the November board meeting agenda has the presentation or at least the basic outline from the charter, charter office regarding the Knowledge Academy's um, application. Mrs. Elrod. Do we need to have a specific date in that motion or can we just say January because we want to be, it's January 11th, isn't it? January 11th. I can restate it with the date. So ah. Just, fine. just yeah. fine. Maybe okay. you should do January the, after January 15th. Right. We, do we? We don't have to have a date. No. 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 Okay. So we'll just we just defer, and then we can have conversation with uh, staff. You just know I like specifics. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Um, all in favor of the deferral? Oh. I, I just want to say, just on the agenda, it's slide nine. If you look on the agenda, what we're talking about, so people aren't confused. Thank you for that. Yeah, it's it's public. So. All right. All in favor of the deferral? Please raise your hand. All right, uh, unanimous. Uh, all right, so motion passes. We will finish or have the conversation around Knowledge Academy's application or amendment application in January. We'll now move on to board committee reports. We'll have one from uh, Budget and Finance Chair, Free to Player Peters. Uh, we had a uh, Budget and Finance meeting where we were reconciled, began to reconcile the fiscal year budget, um, it passed five in favor, zero against, two abstain. There was also discussion um, about salaries and um, also having paid for the pair, pair pros and staff, um, which we will continue at a later um, meeting, but we just had to sure up the, um, the budget. We do this every year around this time to make sure we have a balanced budget and that um, we were able to reconcile the incoming sales tax receipts and the increase in sales tax receipt that has to go with state law about making sure we provide the correct allocations uh, to students and to uh, uh, charter providers. That's it. 
All right, thank you. And now from Capital Needs Chair, Mrs. Abigail Tyler. Um, so we had a, a brief but fruitful meeting about our current capital needs request, and it really heavily focuses on the reimagined plan to get our fifth grade students back into the elementary school. So if you look at it, which is public record, if you look at it, you can see that we have really prioritized getting those elementary schools prepared so that those kids can get there as soon as possible. Um, so knowing that, we all looked at it and, and it passed unanimously. Thank you, Mrs. Tyler. Now, uh, also, <laughs> Mrs. Tyler for Teaching and Learning Committee, co uh, Committee Chair. Um, and we had a presentation on our GATE program, our Gifted and Talented program, um, where um, Mr. Matt Nelson came and talked to us a little bit about the training involved and how it's delivered. And um, we had some questions around how students are able to access the program. and. Um, I, I think it's going to be a continuing conversation as we continue to move forward, but I think good information was presented to us so that we all understand what's happening with the program and how it works. I don't necessarily think it was the way everybody thought it was at first. So um, that was really all we talked. We just you know, looked at advanced academics and really had a robust discussion around that. All right, thank you. Now we'll move on to announcements. We'll begin with our junior student board member, Ebenezer. Um, so I only have, I think, a small amount of announcements. <clears throat> um, I mentioned at the last board meeting about SSMV, and I just want to go back to that point again. Um, the applications for SSMV are in January um, 11. That's when they start. So for all eighth graders that are interested in STEM, there's a very good opportunity to go to Vanderbilt to study in a particular field that you guys are interested in. Um, and I just, I would recommend that. Um, I also wanna, you know, wish everybody that's in high school that has midterms just like I do, good luck, because I know they can be, you know, nerve wracking and exhausting, but we have really wonderful teachers and they've prepared us for this. So just to everybody, you know what to do. You know, you're here because you're <laughs> a well-prepared student. So don't be nervous, just go in there and show them what you know. Thank you. Thank you, Ebenezer. Mrs. Poopa Walker. I want to thank, I'm sorry, thank, congratulate uh, Daniel Myers, who's a teacher at JT Moore, who's one of the teachers selected by National Public Education Foundation for their teacherpreneur program. And for folks that missed the By Design documentary by NPF, it's now on their YouTube channel. You can watch it at home. And want to, um, Congratulate our students for an amazing first semester and for being here at finals week. Um, and so appreciate you guys. And wishing everybody uh, a restful vacation and time <coughs> off and um, looking forward to getting back at it in January. Thank you, Mrs. Bush. Yes, um, this past weekend, um, I am so, so proud and such a proud mama to have my first son to graduate from college. Uh, he attended the MTSU, which is, of course, I would have loved the Tennessee State University, but I still love MTSU. Um, <laughs> I am so terribly, just so excited about this young man. Um, he graduated in four years, despite COVID despite a lot of our students that uh, went on and uh, graduated this past weekend, and they did it. And I was really proud of their accomplishments through such a horrible pandem pandemic. One of the things I wanna point out, and I want students to know, if you're watching, if your parents are watching, um, students like Dylan, Dylan, he persevered. He was an MNPS student, and Dylan came with a few challenges. Um, that we discovered as a, uh, a middle schooler that he had uh, a disability, and it was called langu language impairment. If you know anything about language impairment, it basically, you know, it's a slower process of the brain in, in comprehension and things like that. But through it all, Dylan Bush said, not me. It's not gonna be me because I'm gonna beat it, and I'm gonna do what I need to do to be successful. And it was challenging as a mom when you know your child has a disability, but despite it all, we have to pick it up and we have to say you can do this, despite of. And that's what Dylan Bush did. Dylan Bush worked so hard and he pushed through all his little obstacles to a point that he challenged himself that he was gonna make a high score on the ACT. 
And I kept thinking to myself, I said, well, you know, Dylan, I know you can do it. He didn't think he could do it, but he kept saying, I got to study. I got to study really hard, Mom. And I said, well, you can do this because you know that I'm a huge advocate of ACT and making sure our students get those scores so they can have college access. So he studied. He did things behind my back that I didn't even know about to a point that he uh, while he was over at Hillsborough High School, he did all his work, and then he decided that he wanted to go to the library and study for the ACT. Never knew that until his high school teachers gave him these awesome letter recommendations, and that stood out that that's what he did. So fast forward, Dylan Bush, right before his graduation the May, that May, that December ACT, scored a 26 on the ACT. His lowest score was, um, his highest score was a 19. He could never push past a 19. But because he decided that he was going, he was not going to let this disability be him, he was going to beat it. And even after he scored that 26, he never had to take a remedial course at MTSU. And he was under an IEP. Yeah. So I want to tell all the parents out there who have kids that have disabilities or parents who just get to that point that just don't know what else to do for their children, don't give up because these students are amazing students, but we have to continue to push them and don't ever stop pushing because that's what Dylan didn't, he didn't stop. So he graduated in four years. So I am extremely, extremely proud of my son and being having the first son to graduate from college is so, so remarkable. So I'm very, very excited. I'm very proud. And I just want to continue to encourage parents, continue to be a voice for your children and uh, continue to fight for your kids and make sure that they get everything they can to be supported so they can be successful. So that's my story. Dylan Alfonso Bush, I am so proud of you. And he, this young man is going to continue to do big things. Oh, and by the way, his major is in sports management. And he wants to manage an NFL team one day. And I believe he's going to do it. Thank y'all. Y'all have a Merry Christmas. <laughs> Mrs. Elrod. Thank you. So um, today in our committee meetings, we discussed, um, as mentioned, some additional schools. I want to make sure for District 2 that you're aware of um, the new Cambridge Cluster Elementary, the Haywood Elementary renovation, and of course the new Overton Elementary. Um, and then we also discussed some um, fa some fast tracking of some schools being uh, having fifth grade ad added to them. And I really appreciate our leadership um, prioritizing those schools that already had space so that they could move without being inside of their own cluster. And um, I know that that took some additional operational work and funding that we needed to kind of prioritize those schools that had that space that could go ahead and move inside those clusters. And so I just wanted to publicly say that I appreciate that and the work that that was done by all of our staff to make sure that that happened uh, this upcoming year outside of the other years. Um, and then lastly, um, I wanna make sure that I announce that um, at our next meeting, I will be presenting a resolution on secure, safe, and responsible firearm storage as we continue to have concerns about that, whether it's been through the recent school shootings, um, guns being found, or of course this being the nine year anniversary of Sandy Hook. I think it's an important message for all of us to be aware that all of us as adults that are involved inside of a school or have a student that is a stakeholder, diverse stakeholder of a student inside of our schools, that there is secure and safe fire, firearm um, ownership options. So thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Uh, Player Peters. Um, I just want to thank my colleagues for signing on to the letter about not making school board elections partisan, even though the decision was made otherwise. I think it's just important that we state on the record. We are functioning within a nonpartisan government. Um, the mayor's nonpartisan, the Metro Council's nonpartisan. The work we do here is not partisan work. Um, I have literally been on the Democratic Party's payroll. Um, I have worked in Democratic Party politics for almost 20 years. That was my first professional job with Al Gore. But when I'm a school board member, I check my partisanship <coughs> at the party lot. And I think it's important that we continue that culture here no matter what we have to, um, have to do legally to be on the ballot and, and declare a party affiliation. Um, but I just, I just want to say that how we educate kids and the governance and the management is that the, the education policy is, de, is, is debated 
on the state level. We have to implement it whether we like it or not. Um, how we manage our director of schools is not a partisan issue. How we deal with the budget, it's not a partisan issue. And I just wanna go on the record of just really saying that um, what we do within a nonpartisan government structure under the charter um, should remain that way. So um, just thank you to colleagues for just stepping up and being in unison of that and at least making the, making the moral important case of why um, this board should, should have remained nonpartisan. So I hope we continue the culture that we have currently, no matter how we have to run and continue just that, continue the same culture because we've been doing great things and we've been working together and I hope we can continue that. I have faith that we all do it. I think we all have that unity together as what we're here for, not from a partisan standpoint. But, um, you know, politics is politics. And um, I just want to thank everyone just for, for at least being that one voice um, unified of what, how we govern to educate our children and that it surely shouldn't be a partisan effort. And happy holidays. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Masters. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I just want to remind everyone um, the Surgeon General's report on the mental health crisis did draw to attention a lot of very serious issues around teens and children and mental health issues. However, it did not mention masks as being a cause of mental health crises in children. Um, a lot of the things we're experiencing as a result of the pandemic have exacerbated mental health issues among children, no doubt. Masks, there is no evidence that masks are a part of that problem. However, let me tell you something that does lead to mental health issues. It's called transphobia. So that, and this is, I'm circling back to our very first speaker of the night. Trans kids, whether masked or not, um, are at a greater risk of health jeopardizing behaviors and outcomes. How can we help build a better world for these children? Cisgender people are more likely to let go of their fears and prejudices when they know gender diverse people directly. And I'm going to assume that the woman who spoke earlier this evening perhaps doesn't know anyone directly. As schools become safer for gender diverse students, they will feel more open to about talking about who they are. Cisgender people can become more familiar with them. Communication will increase, stigma will decline, and mutual respect will increase. This is the mental health crisis, is children who aren't being accepted for who they are, children who are experiencing poor mental health outcomes. And I'm not just talking about gender identity and gender diversity. I'm talking about all of the different forms of being different that can result in mental health crises for children. Um, so for us to be talking about the Surgeon General's advisory as though masks are causing the problem, that is, that is not the problem. And do not get up here and talk to me about masks causing a mental health crisis and then turn around on the other side and talk about how you don't believe that there are different gender identities and gender expressions and that, that, is, that is a valid thing for us to accommodate and accept among children in our schools. I'm sure I'm gonna hear about this one, but I just, I had to say it. And happy holidays. Thank you for that, Ms. Masters. Mrs. Tyler. Um, I was also gonna take a minute to remember our, um, the Sandy Hook shooting and just wanna kind of remind us all that the principal who was one of the first people killed in that, um, one of the things that she has always, that she had always pushed was kindness to one another and reaching out and um, not being cruel. And I think that we could all do with a lot more kindness. And I wanna remind everybody, if you are not kind on the internet, you're not kind. It's not just in person, it's everywhere. So let's be kind to one another and um, lift one another up. And I hope everybody has a restful, good holiday season. Thank you. 
Thank you, Anjali, our senior student board member, who we excitedly, we excitedly await whatever her future will look like <laughs> at her next institution. Um, okay, um, thank you, you all, for making this the best first semester, um, being the senior student representative on the board. I would also like to say I'm very thankful that MNPS creates a safe environment for all its students, regardless of um, their identities, um, however you want to take that. Um, I believe that it's important for students to be brought up into an environment that pushes for just this equity and equality and treating each other with kindness. And I feel like us as a board pushing for that just creates a better future for future generations. Um, for my announcements, a reminder that all Gov School deadlines except the arts is due January 15th. For seniors, college application and scholarship deadlines, please be on that. And congratulations to anyone and everyone who has received their early decision. I believe some of them are tonight, actually, some are tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And um, for anyone taking exams, good luck on the rest of the week. Um, and congratulations to all students for making it through the first semester. I hope all of you have a great and restful holiday season with your families. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Little says that he is driving and, of course, doesn't want to be tweeting or texting or, you know, letting us know announcements. So he'll talk about those later at a later date. We'll be sure to pass those to the community. Um, I do want to really say that I'm so appreciative of the time that the community and that our, our staff and our students and some board members took out to attend the different town halls around funding, specifically the last one that was at Jefferson Street Baptist Church. It was fairly well attended. Commissioner Schwinn was there to listen to the different suggestions we've made. So as you're thinking about the BEP funding formula or as learning about it, please be thinking about what specific asks you might make of the Tennessee Department of Education, the governor, and yes, the legislature as they have the final decision and what the budget looks like like. Um, I would also like to remind everyone that the legislative season will begin bright and early in January and that that policy and lawmaking season typically expend, extends through e either April or May. So we would love to have your advocacy up at the Capitol. Um, our own advocacy committee chair, uh, Emily Masters, has been doing a lot of work over the last year and a half to kind of prepare us. So we're excited to let you all know about what that will look like. We will have a retreat in January. Please feel free to send me any requested agenda items. We at least have to have one mandatory training from Metro government. I believe it's Title IX. So if there's anything else that we need to discuss, please feel free to go ahead and start sending that information to me. Um, I want to reiterate that we really do appreciate hearing from the community even when you even when we need to be gracious in our response to you. So thank you for continuing to come and speak to us. Please continue to do so. But I appreciate that there were a number of um, staff and parents who suggested that we need more supports, whether it be around IT connectiv or connectivity issues, IT, HR, and yes, we have historically continued to cut from everywhere but schools, but we have got to be ready to really support our schools in every way possible. And as teachers told us tonight, they appreciate pay, and of course they certainly need more pay, but we have got to be ready to support them as a community as best we can. So if there's any way that you could tap in, whether it be tutoring, volunteering in some way, even working with outside programming or nonprofit organizations that support schools, please be willing and ready to do so. Um, we have currently hired everyone that is in the pool to be a substitute teacher, to be a bus driver, or to be a teacher. So if you know someone who knows someone, or if you're someone that is a stay-at-home parent that would be willing to become a sub, maybe even get your licensure to become a teacher, or become any, a member of our support staff, please feel free to uh, sign up to apply at mnps.org. We are a wonderful organization to, to work for. We sometimes get yelled at, but that's okay because we're doing this work for children. And I, the last thing that I will say is during this time of holiday seasons and times where we will hopefully be with our families safely. I remember praying before I got on this board for maturity and graciousness, and the Lord continues to put um, situations in my path that will encourage me to be more gracious. So I extend that to you, and I hope you will continue to extend that to those around you, because be there, no further business. This meeting is adjourned. We will see you in 2022. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.